committee this morning. Um, we, we have a quorum, um, just to remind all members who are, who are present to maintain social distancing throughout the meeting. Um, today, the, the committee will consider subordinate legislation and we will then look at um, financial assistance for coach and bus operators. And then we will have a briefing from um, the department on Brexit. I just advise um, all those members who are joining by Starleaf uh, that it would be really helpful for them to um, sort of indicate by raising their hand on their devices so that we know when they wish to ask a question um, because it is actually quite difficult then to manage otherwise and that, that, would, that would help sort of speed things up for us as well and also if members could if everybody who is coming by Starleaf could mute their mic, it just means that we can hear then everyone else um, during the session, so we'd appreciate that. Um, at this stage, we haven't received any apologies. Um, we have um, in the chamber here, we have um, Cahill Boyle and David Hildage and Keith Buchanan, and coming by Starleaf, Martina Anderson, Roy Beggs, Andrew Muir and Liz Kimmins. Moving to item two, it's the chair's business. Um, we have a paper from the CAMS office on <coughs> potential actions for committees to discuss in order to minimise face-to-face interaction and reduce risk at committee meetings. Um, we've already taken some action with regards to that and we now have moved to a hybrid version of the committee and certainly all our witnesses today are coming via Starleaf. I don't know whether members of anything additional that they would like to add at this stage with regards to that. Obviously, um, it, is, it is more difficult to, to manage the meeting whenever um, we are doing it via Starleaf. And I suppose that's where members need to have, to be mindful of time um, and also the questions and so on that they're asking. And I think we just need to be more cognizant of the, of the length of the sessions as well. Um, but open, opening that up for discussion, Mr. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chair, William. and I appreciate it. And that's why I had to come up today. I had some difficulties last week with Mr. Starley from myself, but in relation to last week's meeting, I mean, I know there's a lot of members had a lot more questions to ask, and it's just between the technology and everything else, it just didn't work out in favour of some of the people. So we just need to look at it how best we can manage it in the future, because I mean. The, there's a session there nearly over two and close to two hours and I mean I know that some people um, were rushing towards the end to try and get business read up and, and the AOB and everything else. So um, it's not anybody's fault, I just think it's, it's just getting used to the system and I think that, that, yeah, that. that was an exceptional um, session, I think, because we had seven um, witnesses coming mm. via Starleaf um, and we'll certainly manage that differently in the future. But whenever members are in the room and Obviously, I know the pressures that we're under to get out of the room, and I can articulate that probably differently whenever you're here than whenever you're on Starleaf because you can't see um, what, what's going on within the room. But if I do say, look, I'm under pressure with time, I think if everyone can sort of be mindful of that, it would help the session run a little bit smoother. Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. I would agree with that. Um, and it's very difficult as Chair to be chairing a meeting with people present in the room and then also people online. I think all of us need to be cognizant of the fact of the time pressures around that and to ensure that everyone gets a, an opportunity to ask uh, relevant questions. So hopefully today we can have a, a shot at that and see how we get on. Okay, thank you. Ms. Anderson? Um, I just want to concur with what everyone said, Chair. I think we all recognise that it is quite a pressurising environment for you to try and chair when we're not all in the room. Uh, that said, it was a long enough session last week, um, one of the longest we had, and I appreciate the fact there were seven uh, witnesses. Um, but I know for Andrew and I, like we got 10 minutes between the two of us, uh, and even at that, um, we couldn't deal with any, with any AOB. So I think when we are getting a session like that, maybe because of this new normal, as it might be called now, the way we have to operate uh, until we get back, hopefully, to, to a better arrangement. But for now, when we're having a situation like that, maybe we just have to allocate time and divide the time up so that every member gets an opportunity if they need it, whether it is 10 minutes each that we all get it. So I'm assuming you will be looking at something like that going forward. 
I do think that was an exceptional um, situation, I think, given the number of, uh, of witnesses, and certainly um, it was important for to hear from, from those witnesses, um, I suppose more so than members, essentially anyway, but um, I think if we all bear that in mind just moving forward um, and just be, be mindful that we don't need to, we don't need to spend, um, we don't need to have three or four hour meetings in order for it to be constructive either, so I think we just maybe just need to be much more focused. Uh, uh, yeah, and absolutely, I'm just being prompted here by the clerk to say that, um, you know, if we do start to run out of time and I do call then maybe for, for written questions that we can email those through and we can get responses then from the witnesses in that manner. So if members are content that we, I mean, this is obviously going to be new to all of us and how we manage it and, and trying to do it the best that we can. So um, we'll just keep it, keep an eye on, on how we go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving then through to um, draft minutes at page six. They were the minutes of the meeting of the 20th of January. Um, Deputy Chair. Sure, but just to uh, keep things right, the, the representatives on Starleaf uh, left the meeting at, at 1.20 a.m. according to the minutes, so I know that it was a long meeting, but I don't think it wasn't that long. It just felt that long. It just maybe felt that long, but... Uh, <laughs> just, I, sure, I, I, I second that, but I just second that just in case. <laughs> it felt, it felt like it okay, thank you. <laughs> Members content? Moving then to matters arising at page 13. Again, that's from the meeting of the 30th of January. Um, uh, if you wish to discuss um, the matters from that meeting. Obviously, we had said that we would return to some of the action points in relation to the presentation from the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium, Logistics UK and Road Haulage Association. Just to prompt um, folks' memory, um, we agreed to write to the department um, of infrastructure and the Department for Health regarding COVID testing arrangements for haulage drivers who require evidence of a, a COVID negative code of test before within 72 hours of travelling. We also agreed um, to that the representatives of the Logistics UK and Road Haulage Association would agree then to speak to their membership and to provide the committee with information on issues arising in respect of workers' rights in Dublin Port due to delays in processing shipments and information in respect of what measures can be put in place now to mitigate against such situations arising on the 1st of April and July in Northern Ireland ports if no easements are agreed with the UK government. Um, with it, the committee also agreed to write to the Minister in support of a financial assistance scheme for the haulage and logistics industries. We agreed to write to the Minister requesting that she considers a relaxation of driver's hours, similar to that given in spring 2020. And we also agreed to write to the ports to establish what barriers exist to haulage firms um, due to Brexit and what can be done to alleviate them. Um, I'd also noted that um, obviously the call for was simplification of processes and um, also then maybe that might be something that we maybe want to write to to TEO, uh, DERA and the economy with. Um, and in addition to that, perhaps that we would share um, Hansard with those three committees um, and obviously sort of encourage um, <coughs> communication between the committees just on those issues. Um, and in addition to writing to the ports, um, just with regards to detailing um, their experiences, um, perhaps ask them about uh, the facilities that are in place um, at ports for drivers. Um, the additional point that I'd also made was regards to the trusted trader. Um, and again, that was about easing processes. Um, and I'm content to open that up to discussion with members. I think that that's appropriate for us to make further representation in relation to that. There is correspondence in your pack from the Agriculture Committee. Um, they are lining up to have the t trusted trader support people to brief them and HMRC to brief them as well and they've copied us into all their papers and they've written to Michael Gove as well. There was an invitation for us to, for us to observe that, wasn't it? Yes. Sure. Members, anything further or are you content with those suggestions? Probably enough, Chair, yeah. Anyone else? I have my hand raised. Mr. Beggs and then um, and Martina. Martina. I think there was very stark evidence um, given to the committee regarding um, the outworkings of the Northern Ireland Protocol and how it is impacting on trade to Northern Ireland. 
Um, our hauliers having to bring jewellers back to empty, the problems they're having in, in picking up goods and GB, lack of paperwork. And yet we're being told um, by the Secretary of State uh, uh, that there is no border and there's no problem. So I think we should be um, writing to him uh, and indeed the Prime Minister and the EU highlighting our concerns and actually giving a link to the evidence that was given directly by those who are experiencing the problem uh, so that there is no doubt about the situation and that the, uh, as it has been indicated, um, less vigorous implementation should occur and indeed uh, simplification of anything that is absolutely necessary. That that is sort of that is in the that's been detailed actually. If you go to um, page one hundred and sixteen of your pack, the DERA committee have have written to to Michael Gove um, and also to um, HMRC and others just with in the same with the same focus. <laughs> Madam Chair, they may well have done so, but we as a committee have received direct evidence from hauliers, and I think we also should be writing. It shouldn't just be left to the Agricultural Committee. This is much more, uh, much wider than agricultural goods. And I do accept that when the exemption period comes to an end uh, for some goods on the 1st of April and again on the 1st of July, things will uh, uh, considerably become become considerably more difficult uh, and we also should be highlighting that but it is much wider than just agricultural goods and therefore we as a committee have a responsibility uh, to pass on the evidence that was given to us. No, I, know, I appreciate that. I'm only pointing out the fact that they have also written so um, but I'm content to do that uh, if other members are. Yep. Uh, Ms Anderson? Well, the chair, before we would do that, obviously the committee would want to see whatever we're putting forward so that we can all have a collective view on it because I think there's a number of us in this committee uh, would concur with the few that this isn't the protocol, this is called Brexit in all of its ugly forms and that's why we, uh, we are dealing with this mess uh, that we're dealing with for some uh, some of the businesses because the British government, um, there was a, a lack of preparation uh, which is quite evident, uh, and that is playing itself out in front of us. So let's see whatever we are proposing to bring forward. The one thing I wanted to pick up from the commentary that you had made, uh, it relates to the grace period that is being called now from the uh, to the 1st of April and then to July. And then obviously there's one for, for a year for big pharma and for medical services and that that needs to be bought forward um, and that's going to roll out, roll out for a year and my concern is that we don't end up in the same situation as we did uh, in December where there's no preparation done for these businesses so whatever needs to be done um, I don't want this grace period wasted um, I know that we all support uh, and would like to see an extension. In fact, many of us would like to have seen an extension to the transition period, but some parties didn't agree with that. But whether we would have got it was another matter anyway. But we would all like further to be an extension. But in the event of that not happening, and I think the, the TCA has signed off, the trade and cooperation agreement is done. It's an association agreement. It's not this deep and meaningful trade agreement that we were promised that the British government was going to try and secure. So we have nothing more than a, a TCA, and we need to realise that the, the deal's done, the negotiation, as far as people are concerned, and that's the British government too, is over. So we need to have our businesses prepared and I would like to know what the executive, what the ministers, what our minister is doing in the time ahead to prepare those businesses for the three months, the six months, and then for the year. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I think it's important that the correspondence does go to um, our own ministers, but in terms of TEO and DERA and other relevant ministers, but also the UK government and the European Union, because this requires a collaborative approach in terms of delivering solutions. But we need to be conscious of the situation that we're in. Uh, the Great Britain has left the single market and the customs unit, union. Uh, that grace period, which is in place for SPS goods, um, 
is, is the issue in terms of renewal. That requires Great Britain to remain alignment around those issues. And that's where these issues are arising. They're arising as a result of Brexit and as a result of uh, Great Britain not aligning to these issues. So we need to be conscious of that and we need to be clear on what our calls are as, in terms of that, which is, is to remain uh, aligned because that's the only way you're going to be able to have continued growth periods if Great Britain remain uh, aligned. And there was a comment made last week, what's the difference between a, a chicken sandwich in Ken Ryan and in Belfast. Well, the difference is, is that in Ken Ryan, there's potential for that chicken sandwich to be chlorinated chicken. I don't want that in Northern Ireland. That's the difference. All right, Ms. Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, Martina said it very eloquently. I mean, there's no good Brexit, and this is the outworkings of it. Um, I would have to. I would want to get some clarity. There, there was, if members recall, a subgroup of the executive office um, uh, uh, to deal with the Brexit-related matters. It just, I'm not sure whether that still stands, whether it's subsumed into the overall executive meeting. But I'm just wondering how um, is, is that uh, subgroup or whatever it is uh, collating uh, the information during the grace period of how things have panned out. Uh, for businesses and those that have had to operate the protocol, uh, and then what lessons can be learned uh, in moving forward po post the, the grace period. So I, I wonder, could we write to the TEO and just a uh, committee and ask uh, what are the mechanisms for that oversight? Is it left to individual committees? Is it the responsibility primarily of the economy committee in terms of the business sectors? Or is it something that the TEO itself is taking overall uh, responsibility for. I think that we could have that clarity and to see how that information is being gathered, you know, if there's any terms of reference, then how we can best play our part on behalf of those uh, that make representation to us through the committee. Okay, thank you. Um, obviously, there's a point Mr. Hildage. Sure, we may well have had a Brexit vote at the end of the day and it went the way it went. And people in Northern Ireland, some people weren't happy about it. But this is definitely the outworkings of the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. Brexit was done the year before. This time, at this time, it's the, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol, which people wanted a rigorous implementation of it, and that's what we got. This is between the Prime Minister and his officials in, in the EU, and we were stuck in the middle of it. So it's the outworkings of the Protocol, very simply. Brexit wasn't on the, and the Brexit ballot paper. The Protocol wasn't on it. So to, to move this on, obviously there's been a, a broad suggestion there. We need to share the information that we've received with um, the DERA economy and TEO committees. Um, members now have, uh, have also suggested that we write to um, Michael Gove, to HMRC, and can I just for some clarity, um, you want then to go directly then to um, DERA economy and TEO ministers and who else have I missed? Sure, I'm just, I'm just the, the, seeking the clarity on, on who's having the overall oversight or whether individual committees are going off and doing their own thing. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's a central uh, point within the TEO in terms of all of this. So if we contact, uh, we, write, we write to TEO for clarification in relation to um, Brexit oversight. Okay, Ms Anderson. I'm a member of the TEO committee. The, the junior ministers are in front of us today. We have weekly almost briefings now on Brexit. I think the collaboration as has taken place from this committee when we sent the information to other committees, I think we need to make sure that there's that sharing of information across the committees so that members uh, are informed. I'd just like to say that, you know, in Scotland, they don't have a protocol and the shelf ex uh, exports there are, are quite badly hit as is the same in France and, and in Britain, and they don't have a protocol. So it's absolute patent nonsense and people know it to blame this on the protocol. This is called Brexit and that's the reality of it. On our protocol. Okay, thank you. Moving then to outstanding committee requests for information, members content. Chair, sure, just on that, I mean, and we received a briefing to just say here in relation to the January monitoring rounds. I mean, day and daily we're being lobbied by councillors about funding, structured maintenance, rural roads and all of that. And I mean, you know, the department should be maximising those bids and should be tapping those funds up. 
especially for, for rural roads and structural maintenance, and it hasn't done it. So I'm just seeking clarity. I mean, obviously, they will come back, but I want this committee's support in terms of seeking clarity as to why, you know, what, what caused the, the um, or what's the problem with the capacity to deliver those works. Okay. Does I mean this is important? Because each, each year, any of us driving on the road from January to March will see a number of old works going on. There's what's known as shovel-ready projects. I don't think COVID actually. I think that some of the road, the works can be carried out within the confines of the constraints of COVID. And I mean, you know, if you look at any council, being no matter what council it is or what council area is, there's, there's money there. So, just to say, seek clarity again about why the, the the capacity wasn't there to deliver these projects. That's all I'm saying. Because I mean, we can't be hiding behind it. So. No, I just I totally agree with Carol. At, at the same time, when I inquired about it on the ground in my own constituency, guys on the ground were actually telling me, four men and managers, that the, the employees wouldn't work in twos. And a lot of it's all just getting built up and built up. And they have some contractors on file there who, who pick up that sort of work as well, but not, not enough. So the, because of the working practices, there's a, there's a difficulty with a lot of these small jobs to be done because they won't, they won't work in twos. And Chair, and if that's part of the answer, well, let's get the message out because you know councillors are coming to us. So if it's, if it's fully explained exactly, I'm not I'm not saying they can't, but I know myself I see some jobs ongoing, and there's an opportunity. There's COVID monies there, and still there's ongoing potholes, and especially after the Wellab event, there's going to be a lot more damage within the next three or four weeks. So I just want you know to ask the question about the delivery and the capacity to deliver, and why the bids. That's all. That's all we're asking. You know. Okay, agreed. Okay, and just on, on the back of that, obviously, we had the appeal from the um, finance minister in the early part of the week, the fact that there is a substantial pot left of COVID money. And certainly a couple of weeks ago now, we appealed to um, the, in, the to DFI for to be innovative in, in how they would then bid for that. And it would be interesting. I appreciate that there has been a, a request for assistance with regards to post, uh, bus and coach operators, which we'll come to. Um, but it would be interesting to see what else um, DFI are looking at on the back of some of the requests that have been made from this committee, particularly around um, taxi operators and others, and whether or not they're, they're, there's assistance then being given from this department to others in order to be able to spend that money and to spend that money uh, appropriately. Members are content that we do that also. Great. Okay. Um, Ms. Anderson? Um, Chair, a matter arising, different matter. Um, last week I wanted to raise the issue in relation to um, electric cars, cars and how many um, charging points that are operable across the north. For instance, my own constituency in Derry, there's quite a number of the charging points that are broke. And I'm trying to see about getting them fixed in the ones that are working and are in very remote places. So, for instance, if we are going forward, even looking at staycations for all of our constituencies, and if you have an electric car, people aren't going to come to your constituency if you don't have the charging points. It's an issue in Derry and Straban. I'm assuming it's not just an issue in our council area or this constituency. So I would like to have that raised. And if we could get some information from the officials in relation to what is the problem with, uh, with the maintenance and fixing these and what is the plan going forward to make sure that we don't have this situation again we have a number of them not being repaired agreed okay, okay moving then to um, correspondence just uh, draw your attention to the memo at page 30 and tabled at page 5 are members content with the suggestions as indicated and if you have Sorry, Chair, I had my hand up for the earlier bit um, Oh, you must have taken it down. Apologies. I probably every time you do, things very sensitive. Every time you touch it, you know. But anyway, um, it was just in relation to the uh, underspend on rural roads. I think we're all very concerned about the state of rural roads, but we know that uh, the infrastructure maintenance has been um, reduced in terms of the amount uh, that's been made available. I understand from the minutes and from my recollection, the officials made it clear that the money came too late in October, two million. 
one million wasn't unable to be spent because of uh, COVID and, and the working practices as the deputy chair advised. So I think it's a case of looking uh, at additional recurring funding because the, uh, the level, I think the audit report in the past has said there's millions has not is required to actually bring the roads up to the required standard. So let's not pretend it's anything else than that. But I certainly would back any any support that there would be for additional spend in our rural roads and men our potholes and all the rest of it. Thank you. And I don't think any member will disagree with that. And I think there is a challenge around absolutely around that. But I suppose there, there is general recognition that there is underinvestment in our roads and that needs to be addressed in whatever manner. Um, we can, but obviously there's an immediate problem um, which also needs to be looked at. Okay, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I would agree with your comments around that. Um, I think the issue is particularly because £1 million was handled back, and that's the scale of what we're in. Um, and usually at this time of year, this money is being spent and much needed projects are being taken forward, so it's important that we raise those concerns. Just in relation to the e-cars that Martina raised, um, those are concerns for myself and my area and for meeting with representatives of uh, a recent body has been set up for e-cars. Um, there quite a number of charging points put in place a number of years ago. And to be honest, you get knocked back from pillar to post about who's responsible for them. But an awful lot of them are faulty. And we need to find a way to get them replaced or fixed. Because the reality is, if you have an electric car and... These, the, the way these charging points are at the moment where they're unstable, it doesn't give you much confidence to take journeys because you may not be able to get back. So it's important that we raise this with the department and we find out what's their strategy to address in these charging points, which from what I understand, some of them are out of order more than they're in actually operational. So it's important we raise this. Yeah, I think there may, there may be an issue in relation to contracts and so on too, because they were installed quite a number of years ago. So they, that, that may be something with regard to even the technology that needs to be upgraded. So it would be useful to get that um, that clarity from the department. Anyone else? Any issues in, with regards to correspondence, particularly? Most of what we have here is to be noted and to be addressed at future um, committee sessions. So, if you're content, then we move to item six, which is SR 2021-11, um, the Alexandra Square Lurgan Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland. 2021, that's at page 128 of your papers. Um, we considered this proposal for the rule on the 14th of October 2020 and we're content. The rule is subject to negative resolution and there's no, be, no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this, with this rule? Great. Okay. The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2011, the Alexandra Square Lurgan Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Okay, thank you. Moving then to our briefing from the Coach Operators Northern Ireland and Bus and Coach Northern Ireland Limited. Um, <coughs> This um, session will be recorded via Hansard. And could I remind members to um, indicate by raising their hand on their devices and also to, to for all witnesses as well, to, to mute their mics unless they are, are speaking. Can I welcome um, Karen McGill, who's the Chief Executive of Bus and Coach Northern Ireland Limit, Limited, Niall McKeever, who is Chairman of um, Bus and Coach Northern Ireland Limited, um, Mr. Edwin Henry, Chief Executive of Coach Operators Northern Ireland, and Mr. John Jeffers, who is the Chairman of Coach Operators Northern Ireland. Um, you're all very welcome to the committee this morning. Obviously, you'll be aware of the Minister's announcement yesterday, where she stated that she has now written to the First and Deputy First Minister seeking powers to develop a second financial assistance scheme for private bus and coach operators. Um, again, that is very welcome. Um, and also very timely, given your, your planned attendance to the committee today. And, and maybe I'll suppress the cynic within me and, and welcome it as a, a happy coincidence. Um, but bearing that in mind, um, it is still appropriate for, um, for you to put on record the challenges, the very real challenges that the sector has experienced over the last 10 months 
Um, and I suppose given the lack of detail that we now have via the press release with regards to what is going to be proposed, um, it would be useful then to hear um, in your responses um, what you feel a second scheme would be and should be. Um, I suppose the, the concern perhaps that um, I may have is that um, this may just be the same scheme that is extended um, uh, and taking account of the last six months. Uh, and noting the, um, the comments that are in your paper, um, that that won't be necessarily appropriate. So um, obviously there are two organisations here, so I'll call um, John Jeffers um, first of all, and then um, Karen and, and Edwin, if that's okay. Edwin's missing. Oh. Who have we got? We've got Karen McGill and Niall McKeever. We've got Karen. Uh, and Aaron, Niall and John. But and John, okay. Okay, is, is, is John, can you make some opening remarks? He's putting the mic on. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear, we can hear okay. you. I wasn't sure if it was on. Um, the last scheme uh, basically was rolled out at short notice and uh, could, in our opinion, have been a lot better handled. Um, the scheme itself, uh, we were told we would have some negotiation towards the uh, establishment of it. There was a few Zoom meetings back and forwards, and in the end, at the end of the day, there was no real uh, allowable input from our end because we, we were led to believe that we would have a, a negotiation, was the word that the department used. Um, in the end, we were told what was going to happen, and the scheme was launched and put up in place. We were also told a lot of money was uh, sent out before Christmas, and that uh, retrospectively, some applications would be audited. Uh, those applications, it turned out, are still being uh, audited at the minute by the department and gone through with a fine tooth comb. Uh, a lot of operators have had no money and are on their knees. The whole coach industry uh, last summer, July and August, was looking forward to, as everybody thought, it opening up now in March and April. We now know that the coach industry is not opening up until March, April 2022 at the very earliest. Now, to take that forward, yes, we appreciate the scheme that was put in place. It needs an appeal process put into it. It needs a lot of to and fro just to address that scheme. If there's a new current scheme going to be run from uh, basically the start of October through to March, uh, we now have eight to ten weeks to negotiate uh, the sort of scheme that is implemented and is in the favour of operators. There was a 40% cap put on the lower end of the scheme that was implemented, which ruled out a lot of the lower end operators. And these are the guys who actually need more support and need the money. But going forward from that, after uh, the end of March, as I said, there'll be nothing happen until 2022, March, April time. And we would ask that as part of our current negotiation over the next eight or 10 weeks, that uh, the department is mindful of that and allows some sort of scheme going forward that's put in place that there could be almost a monthly payment made based on what we agreed now. Uh, now, regarding uh, the, the finer details of the scheme, I think I would be wasting time uh, here uh, going through it point by point and bit by bit. But uh, like an example of what happened earlier, we were told by the department that uh, operators could apply for the Part B of the Department of Economy scheme. When that was rolled out, it was exempted for taxis and buses. So again, guys took a, a hit on the back foot and uh, they got nothing. So as it, sits, as it sits currently, there's an awful lot of people uh, hasn't had any financial assistance. And I know for a fact that some coach companies are very close. Going to the wall, a couple of limited companies are considering closing and reopening up maybe in 18 months if the, the market dictates. So that's really where Coney is at the minute. We speak for 46 operators, uh, 265 vehicles, and the, the wide range of different types of work covered in, in what we're talking about here. Um, are there any questions that 
uh, anybody in the DFA would want to ask? Well, if you're content, we'll, we'll move then to, um, to Karen and to, to Niall for their presentation, and then we'll open up for questions. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Good morning, Chair and committee members, and thanks for the opportunity to attend today. Yeah, we submitted a report for yourselves. Um, I tried to keep it brief, obviously, by way of information for what is, we believe, a little known and a little understood industry. And part of that report also addressed some of the uh, limitations and concerns we had with the current scheme, um, which actually probably didn't do the job it was set out to do. And we have also been working on what we think is a way forward for a second scheme. We're very... Um, pleased with the announcement yesterday and obviously have to appreciate the fact that the Minister had taken on the powers and responsibility for us um, at late notice and tried to do our best with the scheme um, that we currently have. As John has alluded to, there are still um, probably about 30% of applicants who haven't received anything and uh, we know that officials are doing their best to get through the scheme but um, you know, in terms of the auditor, auditing um, and other uh, concerns. It's just taken a bit more time uh, than they had thought initially. Members, our members also are in very um, precarious position in terms of where they go from here. Now that's not just because some of them haven't received any payment, but that's also because the payments that have been received were very far below what had been announced uh, with the scheme. Uh, as you know, there was a financial standing um, amount which was announced to all operators in terms of the 8,000 and the 4,450 um, for, the, for the vehicles that they had, but that didn't materialise. I think the scheme was fairly convoluted in terms of the, um, and complicated in terms of what was required. A lot of other schemes required a four. Sorry, Karen, could you sit a bit closer to your mic? It, it, it's not very clear. <laughs> The, um, a lot of people haven't received any money at this stage, Chair, and it's not just um, obviously because of the system. Some of them are were eliminated from the scheme because of the eligibility criteria, and some of them received much less than was uh, announced because of how the, uh, the financial eligibility criteria was worked out. So um, our paper has highlighted some of those issues to you, and um, apart from the eligibility, the biggest uh, limitation, I think, on the scheme was the cap of £100,000 um, for the scheme. As you all know, I'm sure you're all aware that the EU had introduced a, a temporary framework to allow that uh, e, the state aid limit to be increased um, because of the COVID pandemic. And we fail to understand why then the scheme was limited, especially when you have uh, coach tour operators who have vehicles um, to the value of fleet of maybe up to 10 million who have finance of £100,000 per month and who have currently have had to take seat bills loans to keep their company going. Um, our biggest seat bills loan for our members is £1.6 million and the current scheme failed to address um, or recognise those borrowings. <laughs> So we're hoping that together we can work with the minister and her officials in terms of where we are with the next scheme. But we do need to seriously, um, as John said, be able to consult. We need to be able to discuss it and we need to make sure that when we go out to our members that we are given them the information <coughs> of what the scheme actually looks like because that didn't happen in the past. So if we can address the, the limitations and problems in this scheme, learn from those and move on to the second scheme. Obviously, at the time that we had written the report uh, to you, Chair, and the Minister, the announcement hasn't been made. And it is still very providential that we are talking to the committee today because another issue that the industry does have is the very fact that we are Sorry, very Karen. Ignored. Sorry, Karen. We've, we've missed quite a considerable amount of that because your mic is very low. Uh, no. So... Um, well, from so this end, I can hear it. It's, I, have, I have as loud as that I can actually have it. Has it improved anything at all? Maybe if I move, or well, perhaps if other well, perhaps if other witnesses could maybe mute their mics, it might make it a little bit easier. But it has been very faint, so apologies for that. Okay. Well, um, is there anything particular that I should repeat for you? Well, it's <laughs> you're still quite low, actually. Yeah. For whatever reason, it's quite muffled. There was a briefing paper. There was a briefing paper from my people. Right, well, your, I mean, your, your briefing paper was, 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 very, was very comprehensive, um, and I'm assuming that a lot of what you've said has come from that. 
Yes, a lot of what it said has come from that. And what I've tried to do this morning is just highlight some of the major issues um, with the current scheme. And, you know, because in order to move forward uh, with a new scheme, we need to try and address those because ultimately the, the second scheme and this any support is there as targeted and dedicated and focused to actually be able to help the industry survive this crisis. We were the first to close. We're going to be the last to open. You know, we may see a modest return to some form of work before the end of 21, but 22 will see the start. I mean, we've got to look at where the cruise ships are and where our, our foreign visitors are and, and, and where our traveling, are, our traveling public are. So in the meantime, we have got to make sure that we address the issues on the current scheme and that what we do on the second scheme is in conjunction with officials and the minister and that it actually works to help the industry survive this crisis. Okay, thank you. Um, would, does Niall or Edwin at this stage like to make any comments before we open to questions? Well, certainly I would just like to reiterate and support both uh, John and, and Karen's statements. I mean, certainly it's, uh, it's been a journey over the last 10, 11 months for everybody. Um, I, I think certainly what has happened uh, over the last six or seven months in particular has been a development of a relationship between the DFI and the private coach uh, organisations. Um, I think what's really good is that we begin to understand each other a lot more clearly. Uh, we understand the importance of what the private sector does in terms of the tapestry of public transport that is provided in Northern Ireland and the emphasis of having that capacity available for public use once this uh, crisis is over. Um, unfortunately, uh, the private sector w uh, came into the crisis uh, at its lowest ebb, uh, coming in at the back end of winter, preparing for what would have been a spring and summer harvest for them, and that didn't happen. So oh, by, by the time we reached June and July, there was severe difficulties. Those difficulties will continue, uh, obviously, as the, 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 the crisis continues this year, and then as we see it uh, alleviating, hopefully, by the end of quarter three, I think, as we begin to see some uh, uh, green leaf shoots. I think, certainly, what we need to do is learn from the processes of the first round of funding. Uh, the, the, the process has been, uh, re, uh, the interrogation has been uh, somewhat uh, I overcomplicated and perhaps over costly, uh, both in terms for the department and indeed the, uh, the private sector in terms of bringing in their accountants to support what is a very costly uh, operation, uh, as you can imagine, for buses and the maintenance and the service and protection of them. Um, but I, but I'm, I'm confident uh, that we will uh, address the issues that uh, were found on the first round of funding. Um, I think the Department of for Infrastructure had a very quick learning curve in terms of once establishing the various of payments. Uh, the negotiation teams have been more than helpful trying to understand the key areas of where we are struggling. And, and yes, nothing's perfect. And I think we are trying to now iron out what our um, in, in, in the system, uh, but I think there is a, a, a much clearer understanding of the operational crisis that we provide, but more importantly, the operational services that we provide. And I think we, we range from airports to schools to commuters to sports to culture events. I mean, you name it, without the, um, the infrastructure of the private sector supporting traffic, then the capacity wouldn't be there for us to return to some normality. And I think as we move forward, I think I was listening briefly to the uh, Martina and talking about the, the electric um, uh, charging points. We started to look at what the environmental strategy is for Northern Ireland moving forward. We started to look at what carbon neutral uh, targets are, the reduction in um, driver ownership, driver car ship and, li and licensing. We started to see public transport will start to raise. Okay, so. Sector fully prepared for. Okay. Sorry, Niall, you, you, you froze there momentarily. Um, have you com are you finished? Yes. Yes, I am. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Edwin, do you have anything to um, to add at this stage? Good morning. Um, I apologise for being a little late. For I had a circular from DFI yesterday saying started at eleven. An update, but. Uh, I come from a, perspe a perspective of being an operator for the last 20 years and uh, we have found it very difficult over from March of 20 
uh, we would do roughly 186 tours from different operators within Northern Ireland to Switzerland and all the different places. But I find that our outgoings has been atrocious as regards have not been compensated. This thing has been done, and I appreciate and I thank Nicola Mallon for bringing this scheme forward. I think it's, uh, it, as everyone else would, would, would indicate, that it's been late. But the scheme, when we went to meet with the uh, with Gerald and the DFI, the we were never given an opportunity for the finer points of it. This was enforced upon us because we, yes, we had negotiating as we went along, but at the end of the day, nobody met, the forty percent was never mentioned. There was a lot of criteria brought in that we weren't privy to, and didn't agree to. And with the result, I am also a member of a vice chairman of Coney Group, which represents roughly 46 members. And a lot of these people have got nothing either because of this, uh, the 40%. And these later things brought in that we weren't privy to when John and I attended on behalf of Coney. Now, we would have still a yard of coaches sitting. And this thing isn't going to go over. We, we've just got an uh, email in from our two tour operators, which... Uh, would it sort of materialise to roughly about 196 tours per year. That is cancelled for 2021. It was cancelled in 2020. And I don't think it takes any smart man to sit back and think, we have to pay on something up to nearly 10,000 a month finance. These vehicles are being depreciated. We were asked to do submit this uh, claim. Uh, it was submitted it's cost a lot of money to submit it, and a lot of our members are not even being kept kept informed what's happening. Uh, and I think at the end of the day that a lot of these companies is, can't stand back and wait. And you know, I appreciate that this this Karen's representing a number of operators. We are representing them, but I speak from personal and operator. I think it's been very very slow. And I, and I do appreciate what everybody else is doing. But I think that sometimes if if we run our business the way other people run on their schemes, I mean, we would certainly be responsible for a bit of criticism. But, uh, you know, all of that, I simply said that this thing has to be looked at and worked out faster than the months which lie ahead because 2021 is going to be a very serious year for operators, private operators. Okay, well, thank you. Um, now, so both organisations have, have, have highlighted how they've had you, you both have had um, discussions with the department in advance of the previous scheme, and obviously then a bid was, was submitted um, of £12 million, pounds, and then this, the total scheme then was allocated £5 million. Pounds. And, and Karen, you've, you've um, quite given a quite detailed um, piece around the £100,000 gap cap. Um, and how that's essentially been a mystery to um, the sector as to how that was introduced. And you've gone on then to, to detail issues around state aid. Um, in the discussions that you've had since the scheme um, came into operation, um, what flexibility do you feel is being shown by the department in any future scheme? We've only had very generic discussions at this point, obviously. Um, we did question the 100,000 cap and some of the other scheme eligibility criteria which we weren't involved in. Unfortunately, we haven't received very many, very satisfactory responses in terms of the rationale behind those, and we still don't understand the 100,000 cap, uh, even in terms of value for money. And as I say, I have mentioned that uh, within the report because it's one of the biggest limitations in terms of the success of the next uh, scheme moving forward. Okay, and... I mean, can you highlight really the challenges that are going to be presented to the industry um, in the absence of that flexibility being um, implemented? Well, OK, what we did when we went, I mean, we put together a, a very detailed bid and as much information as we could to the department. And what we said is, look, we fully understand that local government cannot support and give us all the financial uh, money that is required for this industry to survive. But there was two things were very important. The recognition of the substantial contribution it makes locally to the economy. And two, the biggest costs that we faced were our finance cost, our insurance cost, and our rent cost. And that's what we looked at 
for them to try and support us, which is where the 12 million came from, from at that period of July until March 2021, because at that stage we believe that was what was required to survive. In the background, there was the obviously the um, job retention scheme, which was a help obviously for operators, and there was some relief under the supply relief for the education authority which has complicated this scheme but those were the most important figures they were all there we could prove them we could substantiate them and that's why we were disappointed when the scheme came out even though we had discussions with minister Mallon herself and officials that five million pounds was what was asked for to support the industry it was never going to get us through and now we need a second scheme and I think that highlights not just where we are, it's our first cancellation was in the end of February 2020. We are now 11 months without any money. We are all aware there was a delay between economy and then Minister Mallon um, was asked to take this on. And we really appreciate the fact she did that. And she has worked quickly and she has worked hard with the officials to move forward. But the lack of understanding, the lack of knowledge of our industry, and I suppose the lack of listening mode, because we highlighted the very different business models. We highlighted how the finance needed to be structured, but that wasn't taken on board at that time. So we have people at the weekend, Minister, or Committee Chair, I had an operator, Husband and wife who own a small business are very important to the local school industry. But Sorry, Darren, I'm finding it difficult to hear you again. Um, That's better. Okay. Yeah. Right, at the weekend, I mean, every weekend is the same. I have my own operators on. I had one lady who owns the company actually physically crying to me at the weekend because she has no way of getting forward. The scheme gave her two and a half thousand pounds even though the scheme actually proved that her loss of income was 77%. So we have got to try and do something now and quickly, and we have got to reassure operators who we need in terms of the help to recover for Northern Ireland to recover. We need to make sure that they're reassured this next scheme will be focused on the different business models and will actually provide an adequate level of support to get them through. They are all in the same position. Our people are surviving on bounce back loans and C bills loan. Okay, thank you. And that's the critical position we're in. Okay. Um, so the other issue obviously is the fact that the scheme was overly complicated. Um, and I'm I'm guessing that that has been articulated to officials in the drafting of, of any future scheme. And I see that within the press release that the minister has given an, an undertaking that, um, that the sector would be engaged with on a future scheme. Um, has, that, has that been arranged at this stage? Well, I received a letter uh, late last evening from Minister Mallon uh, just advising of the second scheme and advising that we would be, uh, there would be a meeting set up quickly and they would consult with us on the future of the scheme. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you very much, and thank you for your presentations. Just, Karen, just in, in terms of the previous scheme, I mean, just trying to get a better understanding of, can you elaborate how it has helped the industry, and maybe give me a wee update on, on where the industry is now and how uh, the finances are affected across the industry in, in percentage terms, or whoever wants to answer those questions, please. Well, maybe I, maybe I'll start off. I'm sure other people will 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 help out. Look, there are there are 209 operators in the province and they have to carry out a mix of different kinds of work, whether it's school work, private hire, tourism, local tourism. You have got to do that to try and complement your income. 30% um, of our industry is involved in home to school work. And they were afforded, obviously, their payments from March until June, which helped them there were a couple of operators um, who did key workers for a couple of months to the like of Moy Park. The rest of the industry were completely closed. 70% of this industry were closed, had no income and had nothing. And even those who did get some of the supplier relief were limited to how much they could get. 
the home to school payments are only a contribution to the actual overhead of the company because they are paid for up to two hours per day for drivers and vehicles and a percentage um, to the rest of the contribution of the company overhead. So everybody at this point in time, Cahill, is in dire straits. Now, there were 153 applications, I am told, um, from the department for this scheme. There are 25% were eliminated and didn't get anything. 69, as of yesterday, have actually received money. Now, I have asked how many received the full complement. I haven't received that information as yet because I know 50% of anybody in our organization who got their money actually didn't receive the full complement that was announced. So from the people that I know who've got money are very appreciative, but it's only going to give them pay if some of the debt that they have. Tax bills are being paid at this moment in time and some historic bills. It's not going to be anything really in terms of helping the survival, which is why we need a second scheme. We need the finances to be covered. We need the borrowings, the loans. Um, we need that to be addressed because that's an added pressure and an added cost to businesses who don't have any money coming in. There is no money coming in because our doors are closed. So things are not great, but yesterday's announcement is hope, more hope, as long as we can actually make sure that this financial support scheme is focused and dedicated on the different business models and affords a level of support that is going to help them get through. And, and in terms of where the companies are, in their finances, their state of finances and affairs at present, anybody like to comment on that? Things are bad, Cahill. Very bad. I mean, people just have... They're, they're living under very particular, um, very, very particular and very upset and worries because a lot of them with their finance have personal guarantees and that is their homes. They have borrowed money. They're living on credit cards and they're doing their best and they are waiting for this scheme. They waited for this scheme because they thought it was going to work. And they were able to calculate in their heads, according to the eligibility that was mentioned to us at the start, that this is what they were going to get. That didn't happen. And that obviously only happened for a few people. So, yeah, Cahill, it's as bad as it can be. And when you're living in credit cards, when you're crying to the chief executive of your organisation, who is doing, obviously, working with their best, with the departments and the ministers to do what they can, um, their families are affected their health is affected and the future of business that they have spent many years building up is affected. The last five years, this industry has spent £90 million on new vehicles because they have improved their offer, they have lifted their standards, they're bringing in international visitors and they're, they're supporting the economy. We have £160 million of a contribution for the international visitors that we bring in. And these people just feel totally neglected because they were pillared to post between economy and obviously infrastructure for a while. And then the scheme, which we had hoped would work, was disappointing. But if we can move forward now and we can have the cap lifted, if we can look at the real state aid limit that exists to help businesses, none of us are looking for 800,000 euros, but we cannot limit for whatever reason the support that which we're allowed to pay so that businesses can survive and they can be here to help Northern Ireland recover because we are a very important part of that recovery. As the, as the tourism industry will tell you, and it's John McGrillan has actually said himself, the coach tourism industry is little known and little understood, but it is the actual arteries of tourism in this province because there's not a cruise ship can come in here without over 2,000 vehicles, which we need every year to support them coming in. And that's a massive uh, industry, the cruise ship industry. But we have visitors from countries, America, New Zealand, Australia, Germany, with 70,000 Chinese coming in. We are supporting that industry. Hotels, businesses, restaurants, we are doing that all day, every day, and have invested heavily with no support from government. So we need that 
amount of quid pro quo in return. I will give you one example. The Europa Hotel in Belfast, under normal circumstances, has 50 coaches per week coming in during the height of the tourism season, and that runs from, from March to the end of September into October. Now, that's 50 coaches a week to one hotel. If you extrapolate that across out the hotels in Belfast, even in terms of accommodation, you're talking about £50 million. Pounds. If you also look at the fact that CIE Tours, as one tour operator, runs 600 overnight tours into Belfast and around the province, and there's operators, tour operators from all through the UK, England, Wales, the Republic of Ireland, um, America, everywhere they're coming in. This is a massive industry. We need to recognise that, and we need to make sure that this next scheme that we are involved, that what happens is transparent. We will have to do a bit of work because there are different business models, but we have written our suggestions and want to sit down with the Minister and her officials as soon as possible. Right. And I just to want to follow up and yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to follow on that point because you'd identified twelve million, you got five. Um, so where are you now in terms of your engagement with the department? And can you estimate now exactly what the industry would need? to cover you now for the next period, because you're talking within the 22 here at the minute um, in terms of recovery. So we haven't reached the end, you know. You know well, the, Campbell, uh, in terms of our liaison with the department, I have to be honest with you, and I have to agree with what our chairman has said previously. Working with um, Chris Hughes and the officials, the people who have been running the scheme for us, we could not complain about the level of, of work and commitment and the amount of communication now since the scheme is up and running and they have learned a lot had that been the case at the start we obviously wouldn't be sitting in front of the committee today looking for more money the bottom line is we asked for 12 and we could substantiate that 12. that 12 we've got five we still don't understand why when we asked the minister for 12 and we asked her to speak to the the executive about the level of finance and borrowings and that extra support was needed. We don't understand it, but we, we still need the residual of that as well. And we also have to consider the level of borrowings, which has added, one of our operators is paying an extra 5,000 pounds a month on the C-bills loan. The other is paying 7,000 pounds per month. Now, where is he gonna find that business before 2022? So that's why we had to address and address it in this paper that there was a failure initially to acknowledge the level of borrowings. There can't be that same failure now because we need to move forward. We need to address that because these people need to be here, not just for tourism. Our communities will never look the same without the coach operators. They do support the public transport. They provide permit schemes as TransLink do. We also are in local communities. We do the health trusts. We do the home to school work. We do the local school trips. We do the elderly. We do outings for Christmas. We are in every single part of our community life. That's what our job is. I took over this run in this organization in over 19 years ago. And I have watched every single solitary business work harder than anybody I've ever seen. And I'm 60 years of age and I've been in industry all over the world. I have seen them invest every single penny back in to their people, to their products, to their vehicles, and to their operating centers. We cannot stand by and watch that now go to wreck and ruin because we haven't provided a scheme which the industry is telling you and it knows how to work. So if we can get that proper consultation, if we can get the scheme more targeted, if we can make the financial criteria less convoluted, how can somebody who has a 77% downturn in turnover, who has taken on a 40,000 pound C-bill loan, be awarded two and a half thousand instead of 12,450? The scheme added extra processes that aren't there. No other grant scheme has the same level of scrutiny as ours had. They take a 40% downturn in turn number. So we need to look at that and we need the state aid issue. We need that resolved 
ASAP before we can move forward. Because otherwise, the people who have managed to get um, money under this scheme are set to get very little. And those are the people that have the big loans of 1.6, 1.5, 1.2 um, million pounds. Okay, no, thanks very much. I'm mindful of the members want to be in, but thank you for your answer. There. Okay, thank you. And can um, just be mindful of, of our time as well, um, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you. I'll just uh, rattle through a few questions. Carolyn, Edwin, Nile, and John, thank you very much for your presentation and your and your points so far. A, I think it was um, John referred to 46 operators. A, sorry, Edwin referred to 46 operators. A, Karen, how many operators do you represent out of the 209? And between the two organisations that we're talking to today, do you, does the totality make up 209? No, it doesn't make an up 209 um, at all. We would represent, in terms of fleet, we probably represent 50% of the fleet, um, but we would only represent 35 organisations. But within that, we would have the, the, the biggest operators within the province. The province. Just and just, obviously that works through to some very small operators as well. So there are a number of operators who are not aligned to any organisation at all. Um, we have, as an organisation, written to them periodically um, since the start of the pandemic because we felt that they needed to be obviously informed and receive support. And we do regularly um, do that. And we also have regular phone calls from many of them outside the organisation. OK, so between the two organisations, you represent 81, according to my mass operators. Yeah, so the, the remainder effectively follow your two organisations lead to a degree? Well, probably yes. And there's a lot of there's a lot of communication between non-members and members um, because a lot of our own people will be talking to to people outside the organisation. Um, yes. So I, I would say that's probably right. OK. Question then for uh, Edwin or John in regard to the 8,000 and the 4450. So obviously bus one was supposed to be 8,000, my understanding. Bus two and every uh, additional bus was 4450. What did that actually work into, and why did that not work into those figures? And I took that hint to hear a mention of a 40% figure there. Explain to me, and I'm going from an operator point of view, and I understand that when you're an operator, explain to me that 8,000 and 4450 figure. Did that materialise? Sorry, 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 what was that, Jim? Yeah, you, you cut out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my point is, uh, Edwin, if you recall, bus one was to get a, a figure of £8,000, your first bus, and every additional bus, the operator was to get 4450. What did that actually turn into in realistic terms? Did, is that the way that, that scheme worked out? Oh, absolutely. I've gone ahead, John. I, um, the 8,000 and the 4,000 figures are derived from the legal financial data that each operator is supposed to hold uh, as cash at hand as sufficient uh, monetary uh, in the bank, basically, to run their own organisation. The department took this as a figure that was suggested through one of our guys uh, and used it as a benchmark. Um, to be honest, uh, it should have been higher. Um, the other thing that we would ask in relation to the new scheme and going forward after March 21 is that the department has uh, a few meetings with us, but they're not time constrained and not uh, on any sort of detrimental issues that the department might uh, want to drop in at the end, like the 40%. The 40% was dropped upon us. No one knew that was coming. And uh, it, as Karen uh, pointed out earlier, uh, that had a detrimental effect on the returns and the money that it's, was obtained through these schemes, or sorry, this scheme up to date. Um, the second scheme, we hope the 40% will be put in the bin, basically. And that's why we need to have a very long uh, open-ended meeting with the department and a commitment from the department that they will talk to us and take on board what our input is. Uh, and we're not asking for anything that we don't think uh, that is unreasonable. And it's just, as Karen has said, it's to keep the doors open, keep finance companies at bay. We asked, would uh, the department contact 
the finance companies and banks and see if they can negotiate something on our behalf. We got no feedback from that at all. Um, so again, that's part of the process going forward that needs addressed, but we need to be in a position to be able to turn around to uh, all operators, not just our members and insurance members, the people who, who aren't represented. Everybody is entitled to the scheme. So uh, that's why we need a really good and comprehensive uh, putting our heads together with the department. And that's in the next, over the next couple of weeks to get a scheme off the ground for the end of March. If, if there's uh, 209 operators, and I think I can hear Karen correctly in saying there's 153 applicants, why is only three quarters applied? Who you Honestly, I, sorry, Karen, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry, John, you finish up. But um, some people uh, uh, didn't apply because uh, they reckon when the consideration of 40%, uh, they were under the radar. Now, things that have been taken into consideration are the £10,000 uh, initial grant. Some people qualified for the £25,000 uh, rates bill. Uh, and others were still doing home to school work, which would form a high proportion of their income. So they probably felt that uh, it was, you know, when you readjust your figures for that 40%, they, they weren't going to get anything. So uh, it also takes a lot of money to pay an accountant to go through and do this. I know guys have had bills of two grand from their accountants just for processing these, these applications. You know, so they'll, they'll all take that all into consideration, and the loads of individual reasons uh, why certain companies won't have applied. Could I just clarify something, Mr. Buchanan? Yeah. Um, I think it's important. The forty percent eligibility criteria was actually made public to us before the scheme started. We were aware of it because they did say that it would be the same as in other schemes. The problem that came in was that that formula for the 8,000 and the 4,450 was, was an easy, I suppose, parameter for the, the officials who really weren't aware or, you know, didn't know the industry well enough. And it was a, a quantifiable thing that they have as a maximum reserve you need as an operator. But they introduced another uh, process to that step, which was calculating loss. And that's where the scheme has fallen foul for, for a lot of people because they looked at your percentage turnover, but then tried to work on your actual loss for the period. Um, and that's what has um, muddied the waters for that one. So we would hope in the future. We understand that, you know, there are responsibilities, there is governance, but we, we, we still understand that they, there will be auditors who are over this scheme. And we recognise that, but we still need to be more sensible in terms of the amount of support to the industry. Um, and. Um, the calculated loss has been a difficult one for us. And just, just two quick points on the on the accounting part. Why was that so, so an expensive way of doing that? I appreciate accountants have to get a fee, but was there any change in the, the, the reason why a, was there a specific accountant had to do this paperwork for the operators? Could there was, was a, Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, there was a portal supplied by the department which. Uh, they, the department required the operator to have certified by their accountant before submission. And when that was done, uh, then there was a second portal put out. And it, I, I think it was on the Mark III version that they actually accepted uh, what was going to be submitted. And then by the time that was submitted, uh, accounts had raked up hours and hours uh, of fees. And again, that will go into this half's loss for any any company that did apply for it. Um, um, could I maybe answer there too? It should have been fairly straightforward, but unfortunately, the analysis of what accounted for your expenditure was a bit confusing, and the accountants had to go back and forward a few times to the department. And they also had to be satisfied with the figures that they put in because they had to make their own independent declaration. Um, and there was, I think, a lot of correspondence between the department and some of the accountants. I know from our people's perspective, because the accountants, there was a bit of confusion with formulas as well, and actually the analysis of the inclusion of your expenditure. So I hope we've all learned from that. And yeah, everybody has had a considerable um, um, build from the accountants. 
Just, just a final comment, and this is not a question. It refers to your paper that uh, Minister Dodds didn't take responsibility. I understand Minister Dodds has over 30 schemes that she's taken responsibility for, and Minister Mallon has took responsibility for two. So if you look at that reflection, I think Minister Dodds, to be fair, is pulling her weight in this exceptional time. And Minister Mallon took probably six, seven, eight months waking up to the fact that you needed to do something for both industries. That said, it's been late, and you only said as of yesterday that she's only delivered some money to some. So I think those comments are, are noted, but I would uh, criticise the comment in the paper. Well, look, I'm not, I'm not here to criticise the minister, but I did, I, I forwarded Karen, the I very same proposal. Karen, can you I, 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 I'm not here. I was not criticising Minister Dodds. We have worked with Minister Dodds since March. Um, and uh, we didn't receive a response from Minister Dodds, I think, till late September on, on our uh, scheme. And then, obviously, what happened. But it wasn't a criticism. It was merely stating the fact um, of what happened. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank Mr. You. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for everyone for taking the time to come and meet us um, virtually uh, this morning. Uh, I can remember when we first met about this, it was about the summer of last year, and uh, we were all uh, a bit more hopeful around the situation, but obviously the pandemic continues to wreak um, lots of economic damage to and uh, personal hardship to people across uh, Northern Ireland, particularly private coach operators. And my, my question really is about what number of redundancies have been made to date, taking into account that the, uh, the cost of keeping staff on furlough uh, requires to pay the pension and national insurance costs? And also, um, what are the what, what are the various relation prospects for trade in the summer? And is it really that this year is another year which is going to be similar to last year? And as a result, it will be important that the Northern Ireland Executive have come forward with funding in the next financial year as well, rather than just a second scheme. We're going to need something to try to get us through this is a long term issue. John, do you, do you want to go ahead, no, John? We, 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 I've, I've said that in my opening presentation, and I said it, I repeated it there. After this second scheme was negotiated and worked out, after March from the 1st of April onwards, uh, we need something in place, and we have the opportunity now to look at the next financial year as part of our negotiations with the department. Um, um, it, it has to be something strong and robust that operators are going to get enough money so that they keep the doors open until March, April 22. And even then, I don't think the, the level of work will be there that has been there in the last couple of years. It'll be teetering and starting off slower on a lower level of numbers, you know, because people will be reticent to travel. You'll have maybe more domestic market, more people coming up from the south, whatever. But I don't think you're going to have massive numbers of cruise ships. You're not going to have massive numbers of people flying around the world. Um, so that has to be taken into consideration that these guys are going to need some sort of a package going forward from the 1st of April, and I'll just to repeat what I said. So hopefully we'll be able to negotiate that with the department as part of the second scheme. And then going forward, even maybe have a, a monthly payment on a monthly basis agreed that uh, after 1st of April, everybody at least is getting something towards keeping uh, their insurance covered, their finances covered, and you know, rent and rates. And we had people on the other day from uh, landlords around the Holy Lands, uh, students were going to stop paying their rent. So that what happens is it's like us not paying for our buses. Then the finance companies are going to want to repossess the buses. That's the last thing you want because all these businesses then would fold. So that's part of what we'll have to be talking to the department about in a, in a very constructive and robust manner. Um, now, as well as as well as the bus industry, there's also you know taxi industry, wedding cars, lorries. They've all suffered. And we all should be working with each other because the bottom line is transport. Uh, Andrew, maybe I could answer there too. I do think um, bef it will be 2022 before we can say that uh, our industry is going to be making any move forward. There will be a modest return, I would say, from quarter three onwards, and that will allow, I suppose, people locally staycations. But in terms of the number of groups traveling, that's going to be limited. 
um, I know the attractions will start to open again. And obviously the vaccine situation is a big, uh, important issue on this. But we have no commitment from any of our big tour operators. Mm -hmm. our, we have no actual bookings in terms of the, the greater numbers of people that we bring in internationally. Um, there has been some cancellations on the cruise ships. So I would say they'll be um, very modest uh, increase or any work at all. Uh, 21. Okay. Any understanding in terms of levels or redundancies that have occurred so far? I, Andrew, could I say that uh, as far as, as I'm concerned, we, we certainly haven't made anybody redundant uh, and don't intend to. But just a little nothing, but just a little thing for your mind. We're, we have paid £6,000 a month for two vehicles. I bought the vehicles at 2019. Those vehicles have never turned a wheel. They've never started. They're sitting, and 22 is cancelled. So it doesn't take a mathematician to work out. There's about 130 grand. And I have no compensation towards it, and no tours. So basically, what Karen's saying, I mean, I am somebody who has that. I am somebody who is paying that. I We haven't got a holiday. And if we hadn't a little bit of corn in the barn to pull over this, this tight part, you know, we couldn't, we, but we're holding on to our men through furlough. But again, there is going to be a problem, as John has reiterated, too, before this thing gets gets going. Yeah. And our, from our members, Andrew, yes, we had a few redundancies within the first three months. Um, we had about 30 people who were actually made redundant. Um, in the meantime, what operators are trying to do is hold on to their staff. Some of our people have diversified um, and they obviously the, the job retention scheme has been a big help to them. And what they're trying to do is hold on to their staff. Our industry is already very short of drivers. We have a serious problem with driver shortages. So, and they are very precious. And what everybody is trying to do is hold on to the good people that they have. And they are, they obviously have put themselves I borrowed money and, and done what they can to try and hold on to the, the staff that they have. Yeah. If furlough, uh, Karen, uh, was ended as we suspect it will be this year, then that would have a significant impact upon your sector because it will be one of the sectors that still hasn't came back to fully training. It would absolutely be, uh, it, it would be totally disastrous. Totally disastrous. Completely. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just remind those who aren't speaking to um, put their mics on mute because there is feedback and it's making it difficult for us to hear. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms Anderson? Um, can I thank both, uh, both Karen, John and, and all of you for the presentation today, Karen, for your report and for the information that we received. And I think so that we're all on the one page. You know, ministers taking on the powers from the Financial Assistance Act um, is not new. The finance minister took on the powers for the local rest restriction schemes. Um, the technical adjustments that has to be made to roll that over. We don't hear announcements that they're going to ask for more powers. It's just done. So I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, Karen, John, I don't know whether you, Scott, one of the things you could ask, answer. I know you've mentioned the 12 million that you asked for. Because I know the minister got all of the bids in full that she put in for, all of the money. So I don't know why she asked for five when you had outlined that 12 million was needed. So maybe we could come back on that. In one section, Karen, of your brief, you mentioned the criteria issue, and you have talked about it today, and you said that the accountants speak uh, to you in that generally, and they had felt that the scheme was overcomplicated, and then Karen, you went on today to say it was convoluted. Um, it seems like deja vu. It likes we're hearing the same things that we heard from the, the taxi drivers in relation to those that had temporarily suspended their insurance. They didn't know what they applied. So I, I would like to also ask you in relation to the, um, you talk about the number of operators that, that you represent and just from a rough cal calculation, and um, it looked to be about 43% out of the 209. So there's 57% of the operators. And just from your knowledge, you may not know this, but I would just like to know, Chair, if all of the other, the smaller operators are also being engaged with by the department. I would like to bring up, like for instance, one of the operators, and there's about seven around the, 
council district in Derry, seven eight. But there's uh, P Don, for instance, bus hire in Derry. They spent say two or three thousand on accountants to do what they had to do was three years accounts to show business that their business was viable. Um, you know, for the for the three years beforehand, whatever that what why that was the case, but they did that. And then rather than the forty percent, they were showing the fifty percent of a downturn, uh, and yet they are part of that twenty five percent that were eliminated. They're not eligible. So um, I would like to ask you, so like this fanfare of announcement of the eight thousand and then the four and a half thousand, Karen, did I hear you right? Just this twenty five percent. And um, if you could elaborate on that in terms of um, being the, those that were ineligible and then only three thirds applied. So see, regardless of the, of the scheme, I'm actually, I'm concerned that the next scheme going forward may still have criteria built into it that could exclude unless they include all of the operators, particularly the small operators as well, because I, I absolutely stand by everything that you're arguing and asking for in relation to, to your own outfit, what needs to happen there. But I also want the smaller operators captured in the discussions with the officials as well. So if I could get some information from you with regards to all them questions. Well, firstly, in terms of the five million, I still don't know why the request was for five million because our last meeting with the minister was the 27th of October, and at that stage, our uh, our costed proposal for every operator, even though we, John and ourselves, represent only 40 odd percent, we extrapolated and we brought in every single one of the 209 operators, the number of vehicles, the size of their companies. That's where the analysis came from in our report. We brought them all in. And they all form part of that detailed proposal. So I still don't understand where I, and where the five million came from, and I can't answer that question. And nobody at the department has answered it either. In terms of moving forward, the thirty-three, the, the twenty-five percent of people who weren't eligible were figures that were given to me by the officials from the department themselves. I get a weekly briefing from them in terms of where they are in terms of processing. And they are the ones who said that 33% of the um, applications moving forward had not um, made the cut, is what they said. So that's where that figure came from, the department. Sorry, did you say 33%? No, 33 operators. 33, 33 operators. 33 operators. So that's where that figure came from. Now, what we have done is we have written as much as we can going forward for how we think the scheme works. Nobody knows the industry better than the industry. And secondly, we have looked at all the experiences of our people who have applied for the scheme and how they have been hindered. The 40% turnover, yet yeah, we could understand that moving forward, but we didn't understand the extra need to qualify the calculated loss because it was less than the 8,000 and the 4,450. So we couldn't understand that. That wasn't ever communicated. So yes, we have written a very detailed lengthy piece in consultation with our own members and our directors, and we have it ready to talk to the minister and her officials. And we have categorized that according to business models, home to school relief, you know, coach tour operators, new businesses, uh, people with loans, bounce back loans, CBA loans. We have categorized that and hopefully Hopefully, the department will both appreciate it and consider it. Chair, I just think we need to go back to the department to ask for a rationale about the five million because we know that the money is in the system. I also think, Chair, that whilst I appreciate what Karen has said about the criteria that was engaged with by uh, by your at your end to the department officials, I know that there are some operators that don't have an overhead of rent and they operate at home. So there may be other information that the 57% of the operators also want on the table as well. So the department, when they are devising the next scheme, capture everything in full and let's not get to a situation where there are obstacles as you have outlined here today, because you're not the only one in relation to the department schemes that are being designed by the Department of Infrastructure. And we, I think as a committee, will take all of that forward because Quite frankly, it just seems that there's there's a bit of a dog's dinner being made all these schemes, and we need to address all of that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hild Mr. Hildage, Deputy Chair. 
Thanks, sir. A lot of the questions have been answered. A very substantial uh, comeback from the delegation so far, and given us informative answers. Uh, just one thing to clear up on my own head in relation to Part B of the Economy uh, Department financing and grants. Uh, who, who told you that you were not allowed to apply under Part B of that? Just to put you in the picture, the taxi drivers, the, oh, sorry, the taxi operators uh, eventually were taken into that Section B under the premise that they were supplying in the supply chain of bringing tourists to hotels, restaurants, visitor attractions, etc. And it's very clear from, the, from that criteria that the, the uh, bus companies would have qualified, the depots, not the drivers now, would have qualified for Part B. Was there a breakdown there somewhere, or did, was that not followed up or chased up, or anybody lobby for your, on your behalf? I think John raised that point at the start. From my perspective, um, looking at the scheme, what it actually said was that anybody who was availing of support under the financial uh, bus and coach scheme wasn't allowed to apply for that scheme. Now, anybody who didn't get support from the bus and coach scheme, as I understand it, could have applied. But I think John had some comments about that at the start, why they weren't allowed to. Yeah, it was. Sorry, it, it was. Uh, it was part of the criteria at the start that you you weren't allowed to apply if you were a bus operator or a taxi operator. Now that might have changed after it was initially initially launched, but uh, operators took it on board and didn't obviously re look at it. If they are allowed, they can. But at the end of the day, that will go against their claim for the department scheme. So, you know, the department has uh, very clearly said there'll be no double funding. So if they apply for Part B and they get it, that'll go against their next claim. You know, so I do understand that, George. I'm not advocating anybody to switch over now. It was just the concern that you had gone so long with, without money and, and help. That was all. I was just wondering how it came about that you didn't, didn't qualify the same as taxi operators who do now qualify. So. I appreciate moving forward. You have to go with a new new scheme from infrastructure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Ms. Kimmins. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks everyone. Um, as as others have said, it's been very very informative, and I suppose a lot of the questions I was going to ask were were actually answered in in the the briefing itself, but. Um, just just two small questions, I suppose. I know um, you had mentioned earlier on um, around the bounce back loans and and the, the business interruption loans. Have we any idea, kind of, how many you know many operators have had to 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 access um, those loans? Um, is it the majority of the sector at this stage, or is there any figures around that? And roughly, you know, how much are we that people have needed um, to to borrow? Well, we have we have an exercise, the scope and exercise of our own members, and out of those, sixty percent, um, sixty-five percent actually of our members had to apply for loans. Uh, in terms of C bills, our smallest C bill is four hundred and fifty thousand, and our largest is one point six million. Our total borrowings, just for the thirty-five uh, members at this minute in time, are somewhere nearly eight million pounds. Of borrowings, and that, as I say, for the bigger loans, is seven thousand pounds repayment a month, or five thousand pounds repayment. Those are actual figures I know from two of my largest operators. Um, and again, that becomes an anti-competitive um, area for them because once they would start again, their costs will increase again because they have to cover those loans moving forward. Um, and obviously, there's the the finance repayments that have had to start. And there's the additional interest on those. Unfortunately, we have a number of members who have had to hand some of their vehicles back because they couldn't make their finance payments. But that's the world that we're living in, unfortunately, at the moment. I'm not sure about John's organisation, or John, if you have scoped it, but those are the figures. 65% of our operators have borrowed money okay. under the C bill. On okay. No, thank you. Sorry, John. I would say ours wouldn't be as high percentage wise. But uh, because we would represent, we well, so represent more operators, a lot of them would have 
lesser number of lesser valued vehicles, the, the top probably 10, 20% would have uh, the higher valued vehicles and they would have availed, you know. I wouldn't be sure, to be honest, of the exact amounts because so a lot of the, the information uh, some of the guys have that they sort of keep it commercially sensitive, you know, and I wouldn't really want to delve into some of their, some of their finances. Um, but I do know that uh, they're getting it tight and they really, really need help, you know, and that's where the 100,000 cap needs, needs lifted, you know. Yeah, no, that's my, op my operators are like my children, they tell me everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're more of a mother figure. I probably do. <laughs> uh, just and, and a very to... nosy one too, a very nosy one too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just as opposed to go back on some of the previous points as well, particularly around the, those who have been denied. Um, the this the you know in the first scheme is there can you expand a wee bit on that and why they were denied and um, have they been given reasons for that and i suppose going forward obviously following yesterday's announcement would it be um feasible then to to, to look at like the taxi driver scheme where people were um excluded because of the insurance breaks that uh, um applicants that could then apply retrospectively for the period that they were excluded in the first round so I suppose what I'm saying is in terms of if we can get good engagement with, with the Minister and her department on this and listen to all the points that you have raised with us today, I think is that something that going forward should be also um, considered and included in, in any future schemes that anyone that's been excluded to date for the reasons, um, for whatever reasons, could have an opportunity to claim retrospectively. Yes, actually, that would be a, uh, that would be a very good starting point uh, in terms of the eligibility. Um, the operator license, and uh, you had to have a, a current operator's license. Your main activity had to be um, transport, uh, because we have some ancillary uh, transport providers like nurseries. The third criteria was the forty percent um, loss in income, and I think that's what which precluded so many people in terms of that. But that is one of the areas we need to look at as the same moving forward, because how the income and the different business models that exist and again it comes from a lack of understanding and knowledge of the industry and we don't expect officials to know everything right away we just had hoped they would listen but i think that's what it was and some people were fearful of the online application and their accountants when they went in and spoke to them as john spoke said earlier they said well your your, your income isn't you don't have a loss over 40 percent so they didn't apply and for those that did apply the additional criteria of a calculated loss just for the six months was what precluded them. And that's one of the very big um, issues that we have and concerns we have raised going forward in our new suggested scheme. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Beggs. Hello, uh, again, thanks everyone for their uh, evidence that they've presented and Karen for your for your paper. Um, it, it's clear that there's a lot of concerns out there uh, in the industry and as others have delved into particularly about the criteria, I'm just trying to be clear about the key aspects of the uh, criteria which you think uh, is unreasonable. Um, I picked out the £100,000 cap and then just uh, uh, earlier there you were talking about the 40 percent loss of income i would have thought that it's um profitability should should be a, a factor um rather than just loss of income what what criteria do you think would be reasonable there and is there other um criteria that has been used which you think is uh unreasonable in excluding people from uh support scheme and i know edmund also uh, expressed um, concern about the criteria. So just so we can be clear about what criteria you think is unreasonable. Edwin, do you want to start this one? I, I, I did. In my case, on 2019, we put down £90,000 against a new coach. We've never been... That doesn't come into the, the uh, standing. There's no place for that in it. The other thing is... The, the coaches that we bought could be the depreciation on those coaches simply because of the higher end coach. I mean, I would think in two years we're maybe losing, and, and at the end of 21, 
I would think we were lost in possibly 40, 45, 50,000 pounds. So there's no, there was no, there was no built in factor for depreciation. Uh, and our sales, we lost, and um, calculating, we lost about 10,000 pounds because of this 40%. So basically, we should have been getting more, but because the 40% was in, we lost. So basically, if we're going into another scheme, if it need to be retrospectively, we have to go back to the first scheme because, you know, if you, if you lost 10 because of the 40% on the one, we lost the 85,000 pounds or 90,000 per dollar on the vehicles. I mean, we're, we're at a disadvantage here. And I know that all departments have to be accountable for money, but the reality is we have a lot of losses that's not actually visible here. And those things, uh, we need some way of making sure that they're looked at and they're taken into account before the next scheme goes forward. Okay, and is there any other criteria you think is, has been unreasonable, Karn or Edwin or any, anyone else? Well, look, the 40% was obviously what was chosen because that's what other schemes looked at and was reasonable in terms of that. What, what muddied the waters a bit was, number one, what we were allowed to include as expenditure. When they looked at income and expenditure, the, uh, the amount of what we were allowed to include in expenditure, as Edwin has mentioned, depreciation wasn't allowed and other considerations. And I think unless you run a commercial business, you don't understand finance, balloon payments, or as I say, Edwin's deposits for his vehicle. Mm -hmm. but those things needed to be included because they were part of that six months in terms of that repayment was always going to have to be there. That depreciation was an actual fact. So including a, a more realistic look at what a business needs to include would, is, is definitely one of the, the areas for discussion. But it was when they looked at what your position was against what the reserve was. Because what they said, if what you have lost was less than the reserve that they had promised you, you weren't getting it. You were getting what you'd lost. Without included everything they needed to include. So those things that we have looked at within the scheme. The 40% was probably distorted slightly because a lot of people had the home to school supplier relief payments as income. That was included as income and the department used, obviously, when they were looking at your application, they said, oh, well, your income is actually better because they had the supply relief payment and that excluded a number of people from having their full contract awards. So that is something we've tried to highlight and explain and, and we've tried to take account of in the next scheme. Um, the only thing that I think we do need to be mindful of is the very fact that we are limited with this £100,000 cap there is a bus and coach finance scheme started um, in the south of Ireland. It started off with £10 million, and they are all, all being covered by an €800,000 cap. So they're allowed to get aid, you know, up, up to that level. As it sits, we have to sign a de minimis declaration. And if you have got £100,000 in this scheme and £25,000 or £10,000 in the rent scheme, you're already limited to what you can get. Um, but in terms of the COVID pandemic, it's exceptional. And that is why the EU temporary framework for this £800,000 limit has been extended until June this year. And that's what it was set up for. So, and we have written to the department, we have our, the, the department, and we've taken this up a number of times. We don't understand why 100,000 cap and why we are being forced to sign the de minimis for the 200,000 euro limit. Okay, then a second point then in terms of the level of support. Uh, again, I understood it was going to be 8,000 pounds for the first coach yeah. and then a smaller amount for the second. I seem to have picked up that those figures haven't. Uh, came into being is that correct i mean what, what, what monies were actually given some people actually did get that award because their loss was a massive loss and they met the criteria and they did get that award um <clears throat> some people were due twice that and only got um it capped at a hundred thousand but yes there were certain companies were successful <clears throat> i have asked the department how many, what percentage of operators did get the full award, but they haven't come back to me with those figures yet. But I know that out of the number, 30% of my people still have got nothing um, and they're still applications are being considered. The other ones who have been successful and have or have remittances, 
uh, 30% of them didn't get the full compensation. I, I would just like to highlight to, to everyone, uh, and this will be my final point, that uh, there's a degree of urgency. I know you're all needing the finance, but apart from that, there is a small window of opportunity uh, with some of the COVID funding not being spent, I think the 500 millions and the, the finance minister is actually looking for, for bids. Now that's money up until the end of March. So that's a window if something can be adjusted and quickly agreed uh, and moved forward by the by the department. Um, thereafter, no one knows what money money is available. So it's important if there is some some route to getting money distributed quickly that that would be moved on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kelly. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for the presentation. Um, and I know at this stage of the game, there's very little uh, that can be added. But uh, given that um, they, um, I, I understand, I've had some conflicting reports insofar as a, a number of operators are quite content with this game, and I understand that the hundred thousand pound cap, it like, uh, actually impacts on about two percent of the overall uh, sector uh, sec operators within the industry. And uh, can I just clarify, um, given that the majority of the work as outlined is within tourism and hospitality, uh, I, I thought that then uh, a lot of the support schemes would have come from the economy minister. Uh, so I just want clarification that you're, you are able to uh, ex uh, apply to a number of the schemes that are set up specifically for uh, all businesses and, and some with specific regard to some sectors? Mm, well, if I, I'll go ahead and answer that. No, our people haven't been to, able to avail of anything other than the initially um, some who actually paid had direct rates accounts got in and some got um, 25. There was only 6% of our membership because most operators are working out of serviced accommodation and serviced yards, which is the way the world of business works. So that scheme didn't help. Um, and we've already discussed, obviously, the business interruption, which precluded any of our members if they had applied for this Boston Coach Finance scheme. But we've written to the minister um, about future tourism schemes. We haven't be able, been able to. There's nothing specific for us as Boston Coach um, at all on those. And the the there are no there's no doubt in my mind there will be some operators who are contented with the scheme and the award that they have again those are maybe our businesses that don't have finance payments because there are very different business models and they are contented and you know maybe they have had the supplier relief as well maybe from schools or maybe they have had the some of the key workers i i'm not sure i can't answer for that but i know working with the industry for 20 years I know the people that I work with. I know every business intimately. You know, there is nobody at this point in time that is able to or is pretentious enough that can move forward with the level of funding they've got because it is not going to take account of their um, business finances going forward. In terms of the 2%, that 2% figure is actually incorrect. And I did highlight this out to the department and the minister because I have six operators alone in our membership who have all been excluded from that 100,000 cap. So that where the, the scheme might have said for work, I've got six. We took every single vehicle owned by every operator and we worked out on financial spreadsheets. We worked everything out. So that's how I know I've got six. What I would also like to highlight that, that those people are the biggest investors. They employ the biggest number of people, some of them over 100 people. So they're the biggest investors in fleet and they're the biggest employers and they make the biggest contribution to the local economy. Capping their reward at 100,000 is not going to allow their survival. It is actually going to hinder them. And when we do get up and run again, when Northern Ireland PLC needs them, they are not going to be here, neither with their workforce or their investment. And what we have at this minute in time for our association is 28 million pounds worth of fleet is going to be lost. So. 100,000 might seem like a lot of money. It is not a lot of money to people who are paying 100,000 pounds a month finance, who have um, you know, 100 employees, nor is it important or big when you look at the rates support. You look at the hotels individually, some of them, 
200, 300,000 pounds of support because their rates holidays. So in the end of the day, this is about survival, being realistic about the survival of an industry that is a major contributor, a contributor to the local economy that helps support the local hidden gems, the local restaurants, the local hotels, the big attractions. I mean, if you look at the level even of coach tours that go into the, the Titanic itself, this industry is a vital part of the Northern Ireland transport mix and vital to the local, on, local economy. Um, sorry, I'm just, I don't think, Karen, anyone would dispute the contribution in terms of the tourism and hospitality sector uh, that the industry makes. But can, can I just ask for clarification uh, in, in a, a response to an earlier question about furlough and, and some of the finance schemes? Um, and, and I think it was part B of one of the, the COVID schemes that there was a, the phrase was used about no double funding. Uh, I think maybe uh, I think maybe John was you said something about that, you know. And just for me to understand, does that mean that say there's a couple of schemes that people could apply to, and they choose which one to apply to, but uh, but can't apply for both because of the double funding? And I'm sure everyone understands that. Um, um, ministers have to be um, guardians of the public purse, you know, and put in appropriate scrutiny and accountability and audit mechanisms. But what was the double funding point, just for clarity, for me? The point, the point came from the department itself in our initial talks and negotiations with them, and that was one of the things they sort of robustly pointed out at the start. Now, they were bearing in mind, and I'll go into the individual cases, but there, there was a number of individual historic cases where there had been people paid out money that shouldn't have been double funding on different things. And I think this is where the department has been probably overcautious in uh, the current scheme, and they're uh, doing their own audit before they pay any money. Um, they are mindful of operators having had maybe the 10,000 or 25,000, so those figures need to be in the, the, the application process that the department has received. So that being said, um, we accepted that. And, you know, what, what something hasn't really been mentioned as well about bus operators, all bus operators, and Karen mentioned earlier about you know how a bus company operates and a, a, it has its operating license. That is actually issued by the same department that's funding this. Now, the biggest single word that any operator in Northern Ireland has and works to is the word repute. And if they lose their repute, they won't be able to operate. So they're not going to put their business in any sort of jeopardy by a plan and double funding or a plan for more than they they think they would be able to get. You know, and that's probably the easiest way of putting it. Um, so back to the original thing about double funding, that was the department and said else had introduced that free phrase into this whole process, you know. But see it was my understanding that um there were early discussions early on before the scheme was developed, you know, that uh, that this the evidence for the scheme and where the uh, the gaps were in, ter in terms of the overall package of schemes for both finance and economy was presented by um, yourselves, you know, your representatives. And what you're saying is now, now that that has worked out, you have discovered there have been further uh, gaps within it, and this is now what you're looking to be fixed. Would that be well, true? We, 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 yes, sorry, but we, we put forward a number of proposals, and as did Karen, and the department took some of her Karen's proposals and some of our proposals and we put together and then they introduced some of their own ideas and that's where they got the 40 percent that's where they got uh, the idea of this would be based on loss and not on actual uh, somebody else mentioned there earlier about profitability there was a loss of profitability <laughs> loss of turnover but because historically in the, that first six months, some operators would have had invoices written before that. So that money came in from the March to September period, and it looked like a false income, really, because the work was already done, you know. And there's a lot of smaller intricacies when you get into the, the bones of the thing. But um, one of the things we would ask for going forward with, with the new scheme will be that there is a robust appeal process that we're allowed to retrospectively go back and talk about the last scheme as well as the current one that will be proposed, simply because 
we've identified so many different operators that have fallen just below the threshold or it's cost some operators maybe ten thousand pounds because of this forty percent you know so th th there's still a lot to be done you know and that's why going forward we hopefully have about eight weeks now and if we could be talking to the department maybe twice a week and open-ended conversations as well not in time restrained on say an hour zoom meeting or whatever you know uh, that would be very much helpful and appreciated Okay, th thanks very much for that clarity. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just thank everyone for um, for their attendance this morning? That, I think that was a very useful session and certainly has raised a number of issues that the committee can follow up on. So can I can I thank you all for attending? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, I suppose really just um, a summary um, as to what perhaps we need to do. We <coughs> maybe need to get some information around the current scheme which is operating and some more detail around that, the number of applicants, the number who have been deemed eligible, those who haven't been at who are, have been deemed ineligible, and I suppose the, the, the reasons for that, and particularly if there's a theme um, associated with that, um, I think um, we've also got issues around the five million pounds. Um, the request obviously was for 12 million. How, why the rationale for five million pounds only? Um, and, and also whether or not the five million has been allocated in its totality um, and the proportion of that money that, that has been allocated. Um, and I suppose also uh, at what stage they hope to conclude this um, part of the scheme um, because we haven't received any information around that. There are also questions around the £100,000 cap and how the system is overcomplicated and if that can be addressed. Um, and it's really looking for transparency around around that, that this part of the scheme. My concern, I suppose, would be that um, the new scheme isn't just a continuation of the old scheme as we have seen for the, the, the taxi drivers and whether there will be meaningful conversations with the sector um, and, and proper engagement and also mindful of the comments which members made around the number of operators who actually aren't affiliated to either of those organisations and making sure that they are kept informed and, and um, any sort of feedback which they have is also taken under into consideration. So that's a sort of a bit of a summary that I have of members of anything further that they'd like to add and associate. Mr Boylan. Thanks, Chair Nan. I appreciate we'll go forward to what you suggested. I mean we need a better understanding of, of who applied, how this scheme has worked, to get an idea how we move to the next one because I've been talking to some operators and some of them some of them are happy enough with the scheme, but clearly from today's evidence there's people who are missing out. So for us to understand we need a proper breakdown of this present scheme the figures, who got, who didn't, and an overall view then of, of the thing, of the industry itself, and then we can, we'll be able to decipher where, where our target areas are in terms of bringing forward a new scheme, but I would, I'd like to see more stats. And, and I'd just be interested to know whether it's a new scheme or whether it's a yeah, continuation of old scheme and whether any lessons that have been learned from the previous scheme are being taken put forward, yeah. um, on board. Um, Mr Hilditch? No, I'd just I'd like, uh, Mr Boylan, I've been talking to some operators who are actually looking forward to working with the department in relation to getting the scheme are I'm quite mm. happy to be honest. Mr Buchanan? <coughs> Intent? Um, anyone on Starleaf? <coughs> Mr Beggs? Just one. Oh sorry, sorry Ms Kimmins. Sorry, no, it's just one point. I'm We can't hear a word that you're saying. Can I move to Mr Beggs in the meantime? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, think we should be, I think we should be asking questions about the 40% criteria. Uh, respect. Okay, I've just picked up in relation to the 40% criteria, so uh, just criteria. get some more information with regards yeah. to that and how it's been applied. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Ms. Kimmins? Yeah. I, I don't know whether it's muted, but it's Back, no, I can't hear me? anything. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Just saying, the, the only point, this point I made about retrospective claims, if, um, if, if, 
if this is going to be uh, worked on, that that the minister takes into account those people that have been uh, turned down first time round, that they could be reconsidered then as part of the future uh, scheme, and it, hopefully we get the eligibility criteria sorted out. Anderson? Chair, I would like a discussion with the department because there's a trend and a pattern emerging with these schemes around the eligibility criteria that is put into play after the minister makes the announcement. And just like the taxi drivers where we have a second scheme and then we're told, but they're going to lose money on a pro rata basis those who have temporarily suspended the insurance. And I just think that the um, it was called convoluted at the meeting today. But these schemes that we need to ensure that we get money into people's pockets, wallets, purses, you know, in this department, the schemes is resulting in criteria that is preventing those who desperately need the COVID hardship support grant scheme to be paid from getting access to it. So I don't know why that is the case uh, for the department. I don't believe listening to the minister, it's her intention to have this criteria in place that's excluding people. But the reality is that it, the criteria has excluded people in all of these schemes. I think the minister needs to intervene and it needs to intervene sharpish to, uh, to address these issues. Well, if members are content that we, we write to the department highlighting the issues that we've received and we've heard today, um, request that we have a briefing from officials on the scheme and the, the new scheme um, and how that's um, being developed. If you're content that we yep. do um, that. Um, um, chairperson? Mm -hmm. uh, uh. Sure, I don't think we should be pretending or, or giving false uh, solace to applicants that everything will work out perfectly. There are people waiting over 13 weeks for access to some schemes. So, you know, I do think there has to be a realisation uh, that there's not a magic wand to be um, uh, lifted and that some people, not everybody will be eligible for all of the schemes. You know, I think we need to be honest. Okay, and I, and I think we, we do all, we all recognise that, but I think it's still... Um given the fact that we are in the process of uh, a scheme which has, has been operating now for a, a number of weeks and there's a new scheme being developed that we do ask, ask the questions, um, so if, if members are content. Yep. Okay, moving then to um, our next briefing, uh, which is on Brexit. So we have an update briefing paper at page 149. Hansard will record the meeting. And can I welcome Linda McHugh, the Acting Deputy Secretary for Resources, Governance and EU Group, Mr Kieran Crosby, who is Head of Brexit Planning, and Graham Banks, Gateways and EU Relations. Um, members, I am conscious of time as well. <coughs> and I um, appreciate that Linda will um, open yeah. with um, some remarks. And Linda, when we are actually going into the, the question and answer session, if you could facilitate um, directing who may answer um, each of the questions okay. just for, for time, if that's okay. Over to you. Okay, um, we should also have Chris Hughes um, from um, the uh, transport side. Yes, there he is. Okay. Um, so yes, thank you very much, Chair and members, for the opportunity to, to update you today on the Department's work in relation to EU exits. Um, and as I've said, I'm pleased to be joined by um, both my own colleagues, um, Chris, uh, Kieran Crosby and Graham Banks, um, but also Chris Hughes from the Safe and Accessible Travel Directorate um, in the department. Um, so as we adjust to this new environment in the post-EU transition period, issues in relation to EU exits are moving at pace and today's discussion is timely. So today I want to give you an overview of the work to date key outcomes from the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, or the TCA as it's now called, um, and the current key issues for the Department and our stakeholders, and then we're happy to address any questions that you may have. Um, you'll be aware that the UK-EU negotiations on the future relationship reached agreement on the 24th of December, with the Trade and Cooperation Agreement being ratified by Parliament um, on the 30th of December. 
in our proprietary work in the department um, to ensure operational readiness for the 1st of January 2021. We would recognise the importance of transport and connectivity to Northern Ireland and the potential implications of an unnegotiated outcome. EU exit also um, has an impact on wider operations, clearly, with, within DFI, including water, flood risk management and planning. This broad range of impacts had uh, added to the complexity of ensuring operational readiness for the 1st of January 2021. Work took place over a number of years across all key policy areas to understand the issues and to be as prepared as possible for whatever outcome uh, of the for whatever the outcome of the negotiations. Before and during the negotiations, officials engaged with our Whitehall departments to ensure that issues of particular importance to the department specifically and Northern Ireland more generally were understood. And I'm pleased that many of the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland have been recognised in the in the final TCA. And I, I want to touch on a few of those now. Um, firstly, transport. In previous briefing to this committee, the importance of securing market access, cabotage and transit transiting rights were all highlighted of, as being of particular significance to the Northern Ireland haulage industry and to cross-border transport service providers. I'm sure you're well versed on cabotage by now, but just to repeat, this is the transport of goods or passengers between two places in the same country by a transport operator from another country. Given the shared land border with the EU and the high levels of operations conducted in the EU, and in particular on the island of Ireland, it was important to ensure that our hauliers and bus operators could continue to operate. The terms of the T TCA have ensured that both hauliers and bus operators can continue to access the EU in the case of hauliers without the need for ECMT permits. Transit through an EU member state is also permitted. As a result of the TCA, a UK licence for the community will replace the EU community licence to transport goods by road to or through EU and EEA countries. The agreement in place has made provisions for cabotage for hauliers with an additional allowance for Northern Ireland hauliers on the island of Ireland. Cabotage has also been permitted on the island of Ireland for bus operators. Agreements have been reached with all EU countries so that UK driving licence holders will be able to use their valid driving licences without any additional document documentation. The position remains with green cards that they will still be required for Northern Ireland drivers travelling into the south, but not vice versa. It is important to note that work is continuing with DFT colleagues to examine the implications of the TCA and to ensure that the agreement is fully supported in both uh, Northern Ireland and GB legislation. From a DF DFI perspective, we retain a particular interest in relation to the mutual recognition of rail safety certificates, licences and permits. Turning now to water, in relation to water, as you know, the main risk identified was the potential for disruption of the supply of critical chemicals required to treat drinking water and wastewater. And you'll be aware from previous briefings that Northern Ireland Water worked closely with its supply chain and the water sector, both across this island and in the UK. Um, and it maximised stock levels and uh, did a lot of work to understand its supply chains. Um, Northern Ireland Water maintained those stocks at a, high, a higher than normal level um, and have done for over a year now. Its contingency arrangements have been kept in place um, for that period of time and were adapted to deal in the, with the early stages of, of the COVID lockdown. Um, at this early stage of the post-EU transition period, there do not appear to be any issues within the chemical supply chain, but we do recognise the need to be vigilant and monitor that situation and should any problems start to manifest themselves, the emergency planning arrangements will be escalated. Um, in terms of legislation, the committee will also be aware that the department's legislative remit uh, has been heavily impacted by EU exit. There was, uh, this was due to the uh, legislation for much of the department's remit, i.e. transport, water and flooding, and the environmental aspects of planning in particular, 
being derived from EU directives and regulations. The Department's EU exit legislative programme examined 250 pieces of legislation and identified around 50 uh, that required a fix post exit to a fix uh, to post exit inoperables. The vast majority required minor technical amendments with little or no change to, uh, in terms of the intention of the relevant legislation or supporting policies. The Department was able to make all of these changes before the end of the transition period. However, at this stage, further work is now required. In addition to the legislative programme, which we've already completed, a key issue for the Department is the repeal of the European Communities Act 1972 and its impact on the Department's regulation-making powers across a range of policy areas, which have, until recently, been predominantly EU-led. The Executive Office is leading on the development of an Executive Bill to provide Departments with continued regulating regulation-making powers, and DFI will be feeding into this work to ensure that the Department has appropriate regulating regulation-making powers in the future. The TCA and the Northern Ireland Protocol are now under consideration by officials to identify any further legislative amendments that may be required. At this stage, um, we do not anticipate too many uh, immediate um, requirements, um, although there uh, are some things in relation to um, safety requirements um, which we, we, will, we will be looking at and will be developed. Um, sorry. Yeah, um, but this, this will need ongoing monitoring um, as and when legislation in the UK or the EU starts to diverge. A significant degree of engagement on consultation has taken place with UK government departments, other departments here, our ALBs, our stakeholders, and the Departmental Solicitor's Office on the preparation and delivery of the Department's EU exit legislative programme. In terms of uh, stakeholder engagement, um, both our minister and officials have had regular contact with key stakeholders in order to understand their issues and share information. Minister Mallon personally initiated a, a series of stakeholder discussions that proved to be very useful. As we now start to implement the TCA and the Northern Ireland Protocol, that engagement will continue. I'm aware that there are a number of issues impacting on our stakeholders, particularly in the haulage sector, that are out, out with the powers of DFI to address. Um, new customs arrangements and SPS checks, for example. The Executive Office is coordinating efforts to address supply chain issues, and we are involved in this cross-departmental working along with DERA, um, the Food Standards Agency and the Department for the Economy to ensure that these issues are raised with and fully understood by colleagues in both Whitehall and in Dublin. Um, finally, on funding, the UK Government will not participate in the Connecting Europe facility, which is the financial instrument for the development of the Trans-European Network for Transport, or TEN-T, as it's commonly known. And this is an area where the Department has successfully accessed funding in the past. Officials continue to engage through the Department of Finance um, or with the Department of Finance through um, the financing work stream, which reports the future relations um, group and ultimately the executive to make the case for infrastructure funding from the UK government's proposed replacements for EU funding i.e. that the Shared Prosperity Fund and the Leveling Up Fund. Both of these are emerging and further detail is not expected until the early spring. In addition, the proposed Peace Plus programme is under development um, and we continue to work with both the Department of Finance and the special EU um, uh, funding body, or sorry, EU programmes body. Um, on the inclusion of investment areas for transport and water infrastructure projects. A public consultation um, is to take place before the programme is finalised. So, in summary, um, uh, that's the, the general overview. Um, there's clearly still a lot of work to be done, um, but we um, are uh, I suppose 
relieved that uh, a lot of the key concerns that were the responsibility of this department um, were provided for through the TCA. Um, and I hope that, that today has given you some clarity on the issues still to be addressed. And we're happy now to take any questions that you have. Okay, thank you. And you've answered my question just in relation to um, funding for infrastructure programmes. But just with regards to um, sort of the legislation which may uh, come to, um, before this committee, um, within, within the paper you've talked about, there are a number of um, tertiary EU legisla piece of legislation which may be necessary to implement. Is that something you would anticipate then coming through TEO as opposed to infrastructure? I think it'll be a mixture of both, but maybe if I ask Graham to, to come in on the legislative issue. Uh, hi, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, in terms of the, 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 the tertiary um, EU legislation, which includes implementing acts and uh, delegated acts as a result of um, the, the, the various uh, EU directives and regulations, which are included in the protocol, uh, that will most likely come through this department. Uh, so anything that is brought forward will uh, will come to committee to be scrutinised. Okay, I mean, and I appreciate it sort, of, sort of peppered through the papers. Um, you know, and it does actually say that you know you're obviously in the very early stages of, of understanding the potential requirements um, coming out of all of this. Um, but at the same time, it's still saying may be required. Um, maybe additional amendments may be required. So it's really at what stage and what time scale you're anticipating actually knowing whether something's required or not? Uh, that's um, you know, ongoing work through the, my policy colleagues in, uh, across the department who are responsible for the policy areas which are impacted by the various pieces of EU legislation included in the protocol. Um, at the moment, to give you an example, my own policy area of rail safety, we are working uh, with the FT to understand that. We have identified 11 pieces of uh, tertiary legislation, uh, most of which um, will apply directly. So we're not anticipating a great deal of change, uh, at least not immediately, unless the, the European Union decide that they, you know, they, these um, these pieces of legislation require update or amendment. So a, a lot of it will depend on what the what the European Union uh, decide to do, and how how quickly we need to respond to that. A lot of it, like I said, continues to apply directly as a result of the European Union Withdrawal Act. So in some instances where changes are made by the European Union, uh, we won't actually have to uh, bring forward any legislation because it will flow directly into to NI statute as a result of the, the Withdrawal Acts. Okay, and the department plans to bring forward a set of real safety regulations. Um, when is that likely to happen? Uh, we're in the process of, of developing those regulations at the moment. Uh, ideally, we would like to, to, to bring them forward as soon as possible, um, potentially um, before the summer recess, but uh, a, a lot will depend on the availability of resources from DSO and dealing with um, the, the kind of resource pressures they have as a result of COVID at the moment. So, uh, like I said, ideally, kind of May, June time, but um, that, that's subject, of course, to availability of resources. Okay, um, thank you. And um, obviously, the, you'll be aware of the, the presentation which we received last week um, from the haulage sector and, and the challenges which, um, which they are facing. And while I appreciate um, this department has, um, I suppose, limited powers with regards to where it can give assistance, and it may just be in relation to the relaxation of drivers' hours. Um, what discussion has there has been held with other departments in order to give assistance where required in order to make um, life a bit easier for, for, for those who are um, finding it difficult within the, the haulage sector? Well, um, if I can start and then I'll maybe hand over to, to Chris um, to uh, provide a bit more information. Um, I mean, I think the, the haulage sector has been um, impacted by the issues affecting the supply chain. Um, and that is really complex because some of it is around SBS um, checks, which is DERA's responsibility. A lot of it is around um, the new customs arrangements, which are actually HMRC and TSS. Um, and so uh, the executive office is actually coordinating um, work uh, so that 
you know, all departments that that have um, a touch point, I suppose, in, in aspects of the supply chain can work together to understand what the issues are um, and then lobby collectively with our um, colleagues, as I said, in, in both Whitehall and, and in Dublin um, to try to get some of the current um, issues resolved. Um, but you know that is complex because um, I think some of it is is maybe around teething problems and you know you heard uh, last week about how um, you know some of the uh, companies supplying goods to Northern Ireland just weren't prepared for the new um, the new arrangements so some of it might be teething problems but some of it might actually be um, fundamental changes in, in how business will be done in Northern Ireland and with Northern Ireland and I, th I think there's going to be quite a difficult period ahead so you know we are doing all that we can to make sure that, that the position for Northern Holliers is, is, is understood um, and that you know any practical um, help that can be given is, is given. Chris do you want to say anything more about discussions you've had with the sector? Yes, um, specifically about the driver's hours issue, Chair, if that was what you asked about. Um, so we have been in contact with the uh, with the sector. We've been in contact with as late as yesterday afternoon. We were speaking specifically with people about uh, the requirement for evidence for that. So at this point in time, um, the driver's hours issue, the, uh, the, the sector is quite clear about what the requirements are um, for meeting the requirements for us to relax drivers hours this is something that um we would still need to be accountable to able to account for any relaxations that we give to drivers hours there's a there's a need for certain types of evidence in fact there are five which the sector are quite familiar with we have sent out the the templates for presenting that evidence and the supporting evidence and we've been in discussion with people who are quite content at the moment that they can provide their, their, where that um where that what that need is we have already or the minister has already provided um a relaxation for feed and feedstuffs um the things that the sector need to demonstrate are that there is a detriment, a demonstrable detriment to the community, that there aren't any other mitigations that they can provide. For example, can they you look at rota shifts? Do they have backup drivers? Can they use backup office staff with the requisite driving qualifications? Um, they would need to demonstrate evidence that the situation would improve as the result of a relaxation and that the problem could not be resolved without such a relaxation. And finally, they need to demonstrate the fact that safety, particularly driver safety, would still be maintained as a central focus for the uh, safe travel of tra transport of goods, materials and people. So those are the elements. People have been through this before. They go through this. They've been through it in the spring. They do this sometimes on, on uh, adverse weather conditions. So as of yesterday afternoon, we were in contact with people and generally people are aware that they need to make this evidence available to us and are looking at the at meeting our requirements where they think they need to demonstrate that thank you mr boylan thank you chair and thank you very much for your presentation just to follow on i mean in, in terms of the tca obviously it didn't arrive to, to the end of december and, and the department's obviously trying to get a better understanding and developing their responses to it and whatever emanates in terms of legislative uh, regulations or whatever uh, is there any other potential implications for it, other than legislative? From the, the TCA? Yeah, from the TCA, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I, th I think um, there are so many implications from, from the TCA, and when, particularly when you overlay it against the, the protocol, um, and I've gone through most of those. I suppose, from a departmental pr perspective, um, the TCA was good news because it it really um, addressed a lot of the the specific day one issues that we were very concerned about. Um, you know the the uh, ECTM or C ECMT permits, for example, the cabotage. Um, you know, if, if we hadn't got some of those um, issues addressed, um, you know, I think we would be in a much worse position. Um, and um, you know. Cross-border bus services would have been impacted. Cross-border um, uh, transport services would have been impacted, and it would have been a lot worse. Um, so I think um, it, it was it was a good outcome, in, in, only in terms of the the very narrow you know view that or issues that the the department have or has. No, I, I noticed in, in your your reply earlier on, you said that you had been working on things. So I mean. You don't foresee any major, other than maybe some legislative changes.
you don't see foresee any any other uh, potential implications for it yet, or have you? Do you think you've overcome some of those things already? Well, uh, as Graham has pointed out, you know that there will be the need for some legislative change, um, and and I think um, I mean some of the, the the specific issue that he was talking about we know about now, but as um, over time um, you know, standards and legislation starts to diverge, we are going to have to keep a close eye on you know what we are bound to keep um, aligned with because of the protocol. Um, and what is required by the by the TCA. So it's I think it's going to be a, an ongoing feature. I don't think we've got all the answers yet, and and uh, you know it's just going to be part and parcel now of our policy development in the future. So it's a work in progress, obviously. Yeah. It's work in progress. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just want to touch on on the green card issue. I mean, this issue of insurance green cards, and I mean, you know, I think it's absurd that people have to carry extra documentation. I mean, same same we moved into. We've taken away text disks now. It's all some of the things that we've introduced over the years in terms of electronic identification. But see, we're waiting on the decision there from the European Commission on the Green Card Free Circulation Zone for motor insurance. Do we have any idea um, of when the decision will be forthcoming in relation to that? Um, I don't have any indication of when we're likely to get the decision. Um, no. Any other? Graham, anybody else? No? Um, that would probably be my, my area. That is my area of responsibility. And the short answer uh, is no. We don't, we don't know when that, that is likely to be. We know it's a subject of discussions. Right. OK. Well, you keep us updated and posted on that. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. OK. Thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the officials for coming along today and for all the work that's been done, particularly in recent weeks. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, would it be fair to say that you're still working through the implications of the TCA and what's coming out of that, and there may be further developments over the weeks ahead in terms of understanding the implications of that? Um, uh, maybe I'll go with that one first, and then we'll come on to the next one. Yeah. No, I think you're, I think you're right. Um, you know, there, there are very clear um, uh, impacts or implications which are up front. I think what is becoming apparent is that there may be unintended consequences or you know unexpected things. So, for example, um, there was um, a, a short-lived but quite serious issue around steel imports, um, which suddenly impacted on you know, TransLink, um, the ability for our department, for example, to order steel for new road signs. Now that has been resolved, um, but you know things like that that I don't think we would ever have really anticipated um, are coming out of the woodwork, um, and I suspect that that will be the case for some time. Yeah, the other one's trying to data. It's uh, <laughs> easier for me to say. Data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, just if there isn't a resolution around that, what would the practical implications be around that? Well. Um, you know, we, we had actually prepared um, in terms of data in the department um, for a no deal. Um, so, you know, we, we felt that we had all the required um, agreements in place to ensure that we could continue to share data. Um, so, you know, I, I would hope that, that um, there will be no implications because we have we, we prepared for the absolute worst. Um, I mean, Karen, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Uh, well, really, that's what the department had done um, in advance was really looked at the, the data flows that go from uh, be between the department and EU um, and looked at the different flows that are there. And I suppose there's a different mitigation in place dependent on what the relationship is. So, um, for example, there, there are administrative arrangements around the flow of uh, vehicle keeper information, um, but then there are other things where it will be done on a case-by-case -case basis, so that may be in relation to authorizations for bus services, whether it be uh, interaction around the authorization. So really, the, there are, there's been a bit of work done already to map out the, the data flows that are in place and to make sure that there are uh, mitigations there. Uh, and, and we're um, also, I suppose, we're waiting for the, the decision from the EU about um, 
a longer term decision if you like yeah yeah, yeah. and the last one is just in relation to the green card issue which Carol raised um i think over the last number of years since the brexit referendum there was a lot of discussions around no deal and preparations that had to be done for that and one of the things was about the potential to have to get a green card but unfortunately that seems to have been realized and that okay none of us really are doing an awful lot of traveling at the moment but uh you know people have had to request green cards in case they do need to travel um people who are actually do tra travel across the border on a day-to-day -day basis as part of their work and personal lives um where, where, where whereabouts is the resolution to this or, or is it the situation that this, this agreement is that the green cards are going to be required as a long-term solution um, well, you know, we are we are awaiting um, uh, an agreement with the EU to see if that can be resolved on a permanent basis. But for the moment, um, the advice is that if you are crossing the border, you will need a green card. Yeah, because I just don't think that's acceptable. Um, mm -hmm. uh, no criticism of yourselves because you're doing um, sterling work in very difficult circumstances, but it's just not acceptable that we require green cards to travel across the island of Ireland. And, um, I don't know whether any pressure has been brought to bear from the department to the relevant bodies within the UK and the EU to try to find a resolution of this, but I think it's really important that that is done. Yeah. Uh, that that is uh, the matter of um, constant contact between the department and DFT. They're fully aware of the impact and implications of that, and uh, they're taking that forward on our behalf. But yes, absolutely, I can assure you that the representations have been made, so the implications of the green card issue have, have been fully communicated. Yeah, just in concluding, Chair, some comments of time. I think maybe a, a letter to the department outlining our concerns around this and that the prompt resolution is needed would be properly uh, pertinent. Okay, thank you. Mr. Or, sorry, Miss Anderson. Uh, I just want to concur with what Andrew uh, said there and Cahill before him because there are 30,000 people across the border every day to work uh, or to study uh, and this matter needs to be resolved. Um, can I ask if the minister needs to address the regulations to keep the regulator in policy approach uh, with the South of Ireland, just picking up in what, what was said in the presentation, what kind of process would need to be taken, re the regulatory making powers that was referred to? Graham, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, um, the, the in, in terms of making the, the, the regulations to to maintain alignment with, uh, with with the European Union or with, with um, Ireland will entirely depend on the policy area. Uh, m many of the uh, primary legislative powers are already in place to uh, enable the minister to, to make regulations to, to maintain that alignment. Um, there are some areas where we would have previously relied on provisions within the, the European Communities Act, which has now been repealed, and TEO are, are leading a uh, a, a project to try and address those gaps where they exist. Um, okay, I'm on the TEO committee. I can pick that up there too, but I just think as, as a committee, we need to be across what kind of regulatory making powers uh, that the minister will have, the department will have as that's unfolded. Can I ask again, just for some clarity in relation to the public transport and the cabotage uh, in terms of interbus? Um, the agreement by the end of the year that was talked about um, a couple of months ago, and obviously that year has come and gone. So could you comment on that, and has the issues that were addressed back at the previous committee been ironed out? Yeah, so th that's where the TCA actually um, was a great help, because it, it provided um, for cross-border services on the island of Ireland and, and for cabotage in terms of bus services. So. You know, it means that if um, Translink is operating a service to Dublin, it can pick up in Dundalk and take on to Dublin. Um, you know, because that was an, another another problem. Um, so, uh, I mean, there, there is potentially a, a wider issue if there are bus operators um, from here who want to say do bus services to France, um, and that's I think where we would have to rely on the wider. Uh, UK EU negotiations um, on 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 interbus. Although I think some of that is still allowed. Um, Kieran, can you maybe elaborate? 
Yes, in terms of what's now in place, there there is the interbus agreement um, is in place for occasional services, um, and that's for um, any operator from Northern Ireland or GB travelling into the EU. And I suppose where the TCA has been helpful is that it's allowed then occasional services with cabotage added on. So uh, the interbus agreement didn't allow for cabotage, um, and at the present time there are no special and regular services. So uh, what we have now is in terms of mainland EU you're looking at um, the interbus agreement, but on the island of Ireland, we have the additional arrangements around cabotage and also special and regular services. That's that's what I wanted to hear, Kieran. if there was the interbus agreement with the uh, cabotage, Linda. Uh, Linda, when you mentioned the TCA, it didn't include rail um, in terms of rail safety as part of the agreement with the EU. Uh, railways, uh, my understanding, they were included, obviously, in the Irish protocol. protocol. Mm-hmm. However, it only covers the interoperability of the rail system. So what are the implications of the TCA not including the rail safety as part of the agreement? I think I think it wasn't included because it was in the protocol. So it's actually the protocol is the lead document for rail okay. safety. Now, Graham, do you want to say anything more on that point? Yeah, just uh, yeah. In, in terms of um, interoperability, yes, the, the lead document is uh, the, the, the protocol. And that is why issues around rail interoperability weren't included in uh, the, the TCA. Uh, rail safety doesn't feature neither. Now, uh, in, in some respects, I, the, the, the implications of that are that there is the potential for a different regulatory framework to, to be in place uh, in, in the north and uh, compared to what will be in place in the south. Uh, that just means that Essentially, the real uh, operating companies will have to ensure that they, they, they meet whatever requirements uh, are in place in whichever jurisdiction they are operating in. However, at this moment in time, we, uh, we have broad alignment on, on rail safety, and the minister has uh, given a commitment that that will, that will be maintained uh, at least 2021 and going forward. We, as we mentioned uh, in the presentation, the, um, there, there will be a set of rail safety regulations brought forward in 2021 to ensure that we, we align on the issue of um, rail safety certification. I think, Chair, it's going to be important that the committee members are kept across any divergence that may appear so that uh, we do have companies understanding that there may be a difference and we need to make sure that we're scrutinising that. Finally, one last question in relation to Ross Lair. I'm told that it's doing very well. Uh, it's increased sixfold, I believe. There's a new vessel from Stena. Um, it's reassigned from business or from Belfast to uh, to Birkenhead. So given that um, businesses in Britain were hopelessly unprepared for, for this Brexit, can I ask this grace period, is that being used wisely? Is the department engaging with the industry? We heard from many of them last week. We know they're looking for an extension. We'd support them, but we don't think that may happen. So are they looking at the supply chain and the different offerings and I refer to what's happening at Ross Lair, for instance, there's one method that may assist them going forward and how is the department working with the industry to ensure that they take advantage of that supply chain? Yeah, well, you know, I think this, as I said before, this is going to mean a new way of doing business and I think, you know, the sector um, and the industry itself is going to have to find the, the best way to resolve some some of the some of the issues and I know um, you know there has been that uh, displacement um, particularly because of the issues between um, Dublin and Holyhead um, where there there do seem to be real issues now as I said in my opening uh, or earlier on you know some of that might be because of teething problems some of it might just be that there will be a fundamental shift and change in how goods are moved around and and indeed where Northern Ireland sources products from um, you know, as some of these trading problems with with GB start to manifest themselves, so I think that's why it's really important that um, you know there is a, a, a collective effort around the executive with all departments that have that have an interest in this issue um, to work together, um, because you know we don't know, for example, um, you know what impact will there be um, when we come out of lockdown and um, the. Uh, uh, hospitality sector starts to open up you know they're going to need more foodstuffs in than are currently coming in the retail sector when it opens there'll be more 
more flow of goods. So, you know, we, we do need to start mapping out uh, what um, the next couple of months look like and make sure that we're in the best possible position um, to support the sector as and when um, the grace period finishes. Um, so that's why that, that, that work that's been coordinated by the Executive Office is going to be so important. Okay, Chair, I know that the members will not all collectively agree that Brexit has been a non-mitigated disaster, but I think in the context of the Good Friday Agreement, the all-ireland economy, you can see opportunities for strengthening that. Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, um, and, and thanks, Linda, and, and others for, for another very comprehensive um, presentation. I suppose there's been quite a number of questions asked already. I suppose I just a, a couple um, around the uh, the common framework. That's just to say, can we get an update on, on that and their current stand? And um, I know last time we discussed Brexit, they were at phase four, but phase five, I suppose, is the post implementation period. So it's just to try and get a bit of an update on that. Yeah. Well, I know next week um, you've got. Uh somebody coming from planning to talk about the common framework for uh, uh, hazardous substances. Um, but, you know, uh, at the moment, I think, you know, there has been no further movement really since the last time we, we updated you on common frameworks. You know, it's they're there as a process to start to deal with potential divergence. But at this early stage, there really isn't an awful lot of divergence happening. I mean, Graham, I don't know if you want to say anything more on common frameworks. Uh, yeah, um, no, the the, uh, the common frameworks are still in phase four. Uh, they're going through the, the, the parliamentary scrutiny process. Um, as Linda mentioned, uh, the hazardous substances land use planning aspects uh, common framework is coming back next week. Um, we've been liaising with committee to try and identify an appropriate slot for the remaining uh, transport related uh, common frameworks so that they can be subject to, to, to further scrutiny as well. Um, so yes, they, they have been um, provisionally agreed, uh, and it's just a matter now of uh, of moving to, to finalisation and implementation. But that, of course, is, is subject to the scrutiny process. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. And I know we talked. Uh, you talked earlier about um, the hauliers and, and the drivers hours and those challenges. Um, and obviously, we got the the briefing last week, which was very detailed about the, the challenges they're facing. Um, and. You as well know that you know I and others have repeatedly been asking the minister to provide financial support for hauliers, firstly due to COVID, but now um, as well as uh, the impacts of Brexit. Uh, do you know is the department reviewing that decision um, not to issue support to hauliers, or is it something that we're now looking at? Chris, can you take that one? Yeah, the. Um... The, this is this is an evidence-based intervention. Um, so at this stage, at this point in time, we will look at any evidence that is provided, and the minister has made that clear on a number of occasions. Um, I think I would draw there is there is an issue around the evidence provided right up until the end of December, where we have evidence from um, national surveys, is that the sector, while it had experienced difficulties, that was not. That was not across all, all providers, and there were some people who had actually seen an increase in business, and supply chains had, had displayed a lot of robustness, and there was a continuation of supply chains of food and medicine. Um, that took us up until the end of December. Any intervention that would be available from DFI would, be done under, would need to be done under evidence-based and uh, special circumstances. We're now moving from the. We're now moving into the impact of the current arrangements under the um, under the protocol. That is less of a. That is now business as usual, as Linda has already said. So, it's well. It's a, you know. It is exceptional. Is it, it is actually now business as usual. So it's. This is a matter of we will look at any evidence, and the minister has made clear. Um, consistently, that evidence that is provided will be considered and looked at at that point in time. I think, Chris, you know, you talk about a national survey there and, uh, you know, we've had numerous engagements both in committee and outside of the committee with Hollyers and I totally agree, I've, I've said this time and time again, that it needs to be a bespoke package because um, a lot of Hollyers have are, had been okay and, and depending on what um, supply they're involved in and, and, and what goods they're transporting. But but the fact is that there's, there's so many there that were their business was completely decimated and continued to be. So... You know that that's what the I, I don't know what evidence you need to see that, but I mean, what engagement has the department had with the hauliers themselves on that? Because 
you know, this is certainly not the message we are getting. And, and you know, you've heard, I'm sure you, you heard the Holliers last week who said that the, the impacts of COVID are now, double, are now coupled with, with the challenges that Brexit have presented with. So there's many of them. You know, Paul Jackson and others said last week that if they don't get financial support, there, there's a risk that their businesses are going to collapse. So I do think we need to really, really look at that, you know, uh, prior to December. Um, it's very clear from any engagement that I've had that um, there are hauliers out there who have suffered greatly due to COVID and, and now as well as Brexit. So, you know, I, I've, I've said it time and time again, I, it, it, and it's similar to, to the briefing we've had there from the bus and coach operators, and, you know, everybody's been impacted differently. So, you know, I don't understand why we have to take a blanket approach and say, yes, yeah, some have done, have done well out of some businesses, has actually, some business has actually increased. Um, but that's certainly not the case for, for all and for a lot of them that, that I've spoken to. The engagement would be pr- pretty much on a daily basis with the with the sector. So, and as I said, we have made it clear that we look at any evidence that's provided to us. Okay. okay. And just my final question then, um, I th- I put just on that, I think, you know, I know f- we, we've spoken to the likes of Seamus Lehane and, and John Martin and that on a number of occasions, and that was certainly the message we were getting from them as representatives of the sector. So, um, it's you know it's it's disappointing to think that, that that there hasn't been enough evidence to provide, but it's something I suppose we can work on as a committee. Um, just the very last point I want to make in the briefing, it states that the department is still very heavily involved in managing the the impact of COVID, um, with the, the added challenge of ensuring the potential impacts of the TCA are mitigated. Can you elaborate a wee bit more on on the challenges in relation to that? Uh, well, I suppose that the the, the... The main area is really um, in relation to TransLink. You know, TransLink continues to um, experience very low um, passenger numbers and therefore low low income. Um, you know, there, there are um, that you know, they've had to deal with issues around um, the health and safety of their staff, and I think they've done that very well. I mean, very very few of their staff have actually contracted COVID, um, and I think that's testament to. Um, you know the the good work that's that's been done, um, and you know equally um, in terms of our own department, you know we have taken health and safety very very seriously. Um, so uh, again, um, COVID numbers amongst our, our own staff is, is quite low, um, but certainly in the run up to Christmas, you know there there was a lot of um, planning around. You know the the potential impact of of uh, the end of the transition period coupled with COVID, um, and that was right across the, the board. Um, it just made, you know, what, one of those would be hard enough to deal with, but the, the two at the same time just made it um, even more, more complex. Um, and, you know, for example, at ports, you know, at the same time as, um, you know, passenger numbers were being impacted, they were also trying to gear up for... Um, uh, the the new health checks and and I think Dara has actually done a very good job um, very quickly to get the arrangements required in place because we we were concerned at one point that there might be a bit of traffic um, chaos around ports but that didn't materialise um, you know we we had um, PSNI actually in our um, uh, TICC or you know Transport Information Centre uh, Control Centre um, for. Uh, about 48 hours um, and they were expecting to be there for a lot longer and they they actually didn't need to be there because the, there wasn't the sort of build up that we, we thought there might be um, possibly because the, the, the TCA did address you know a lot of the issues that we were fearing um, but at a very late stage clearly um, so you know it, it did um, com- complicate the arrangements that we had to put in place as a department to prepare for all of this um, but you know we're, we're relieved that we got through it I mean believe me I'm not saying that there aren't issues but it could have been a lot worse yeah okay no thank you Linda Look, that's me thanks very much um, and thank you Chair. okay thank you Mr Beggs Hello there again, thanks. Uh, um, uh, last week when we had um, representatives of the uh, haulage uh, supply chain with us, they indicated they were having to bring back empty trailers at their cost uh, and, and lose significant monies. And they also indicated of significant delays, particularly at Dublin, at the Port of Dublin, 
um, which was also adding to cost and having to send down uh, alternate drivers, et cetera, because of uh, driver's hours. So my question is, when drivers are caught up in these long delays, is that included on their tachographs or is there a need for a relaxation there? Chris, do you want to take that one? Um, the relaxations apply. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, Mr. Beggs, about the, uh, the tachograph issue on that detail, but um, I know that the relaxations that apply in each jurisdiction apply within that jurisdiction. So the relaxations that have taken place in GB and in the Republic of Ireland, both apply whenever you're in that jurisdiction, and that's where most of the uh, the, the holdups are. So well, you can't. Sorry. Yep. So sorry. Yes. Sir. Oh, okay. The, the, the delays in, in the Republic of Ireland um, have been very considerable, and I understand from the industry that up to a third of the loads are being inspected in detail. Is that an expectation that we can uh, believe is coming to Northern Ireland when our exemption period runs out, or is that uh, being overzealous and, and causing part of the problems? I certainly wouldn't have any insight on that. No, I think that that's really an issue for, for HMRC and um, TSS. Um, but I mean, I do know that the Welsh government is equally concerned by um, the delays in Dublin because it's impacting on um, you know the, the 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 trade that routes through Holyhead, um, and I know the Welsh government has also made representations to the UK government to try and sort some of this out, um, either you know unilaterally or in in um, negotiations with the Irish government. Um, has our department made representations to highlight? concerns around this and, and indeed to establish uh, whatever rules apply regarding tachographs and how, how relaxations may help? Um, so there would be constant, there would be daily contact between the department and the and, uh, um, Department for Transport, DFT in England. Um, on those specific issues, if they're out with our jurisdiction, then if they're out with our remit, we probably wouldn't have been making representations on them, but certainly on the issues of relaxations um, for drivers' hours, yes, that is something that is we're in constant contact with. But the uh, the requirement for the evidence to show that there's a need for a relaxation in Northern Ireland needs to be demonstrated um, to us uh, at a local level. But, so, but and, uh, just you to make ask... representations over basic things such as toilet facilities, which you understand have been a problem in the Port of Dublin. Um, I don't know that there's been anything that specific, um, but what I can say is that um, you know, the executive office have been leading the, um, I suppose, the, the lobbying and the representation um, in terms of, of deal dealings with um, Whitehall. Um, and I think it's probably right that it's coordinated that way because, you know, so many departments have an interest in this and, and, and a role to play. Um, as I said, you know, most of the issues are actually around customs declarations and um, the, the SPS checking for um, you know, cert certain types of, of foodstuffs and agricultural products. So, you know, DERA has a big role to play, as does the um, Food Standards Agency. Um, and they are clearly concerned um, about all the delays in, in the supply chains. So, you know, working collectively, I think we're going to get to a better position than you know, if if we try unilaterally, that said, um, both my minister and my permanent secretary have written to their counterparts in the Department for Transport um, over the last year, um, highlighting some of the potential issues that 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 you know we um, were dealing with, um, and and seeking their help to try and resolve them. Can you give us any update over the issue of groupage, uh, which is particularly important to Northern Ireland because smaller firms uh, will rely on pallets or not part loads rather than full loads. And yeah. we primarily are a, a, an area with small and medium sized companies. Um, so in terms of uh, group vision and dare say for that matter, parcels going forward, um, can you advise have practical methods been established that will enable normal trade to occur to small companies 
and that uh, that barrier to trade uh, with the rest of the United Kingdom will, will be uh, overcome. Well, I mean, that's not an area that where we have any powers, but I am aware that, that there are discussions ongoing. Um, but it would be with HMRC and TSS. Okay, you seem to be saying it's all somebody else's fault. Well, a final point but, then. But do you, kind of, do you, sorry, do you have any is... input into the Joint Committee or the Joint Committee Working Group? Has it been established and does the department um, responsible for transportation in Northern Ireland have any input into it? Oh, that's right. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I think that the, the main um, representation from Northern Ireland is actually the junior ministers and TEO. Um, and as and when re required, um, you know, a minister or ministers may be invited to join um, the the joint committee. Um, but that's the way it's, it's operating um, from the Northern Ireland perspective. My, my question is around the joint committee working group, which I understood was to include representative, a wider representation, including industry. Has it been established yet? Or, or are you part of it? Not that I'm aware of at the moment. Okay. Uh, well, I just uh, I, can you can you give us a, a reassurance that the difficulties that have been experienced in Dublin will not be coming to Larn, Belfast, Moran Point on the first of April. At this point, no, um, because I think a lot of well, a lot of the difficulties that are being experienced are out with the powers of this department. So, um, you know, I, I know that there are discussions ongoing, and we're aware that that you know there is a need to try and avoid a cliff edge, and we're doing all that we can to make sure that those that ha that do have the powers to resolve the issues are aware of what the problems are. Um, but that's that's all we can do at this point in time. And just for my clarity, where who's the decision makers now? Who, who decides these things? Is this the joint committee? Uh, I suppose it, it will ultimately be a negotiation between the UK and the EU, um, and uh, because that's that's where the the final um, resolutions will need to be agreed. It's it's an international agreement, so it, it will have to be done at national level. Well, national to EU. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and can I, no one else has indicated at this stage. Can I thank Linda and the team for, for coming this morning. And obviously, this is a work in progress, and we will we'll obviously receive a, a briefing in the not too distant future in relation to all of these issues. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, there's quite a number of the issues that which were raised there, which we will be looking at again, and the issues particularly around. Um, Hauliers, uh, we are going to be in communication with a variety of departments and ministers, so hopefully we will get um, some more clarity around that. Um, have members anything else they wish to add at this stage in um, any communication we need to have with the department? Okay, content. Okay, thank you. Moving then to our forward work program, just draw your attention to that at page 163, if you're content. Do members have any other business they wish to raise at this stage? Yes, Chair. Okay, Ms. Cummings. Can you hear me okay, yeah? Yes, I can. Yeah, no, it's just in relation to the, the taxi operators. Um, obviously, we had them in a few weeks back, um, and you know they were saying, I suppose, their need for, for proper financial support. We had some correspondence from one of the local taxi operators here in my constituency. Um, you know, still very disappointed by the lack of support um, during this period. So it's just to see, can we go back to the minister to say, you know, I think she really needs to look at this again. Um, it's very clear that they need support. Um, they, they, they don't think Part B of the COVID restriction scheme will even cut the mustard for the type of uh, overheads and, and the, the money they're losing. Um, for B, I think it's it's an urgent matter, and like all the other um, sectors we've been discussing today and over the last couple of weeks, I think they should be prioritised as well. Okay, I think we did have correspondence to the minister with regards to taxi mm -hmm. operators. Um, we can certainly revisit that again. Um, I mean, this is something which is going to be ongoing given um, the um, continuation of restrictions uh, and the impact that that's going to have on that sector. So. Um, and certainly raise that with them again. OK. 
Okay, members, anything else? It's still outstanding. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's still, the, the response is still outstanding, but we can follow that up. Okay, members, um, just before you leave, just obviously make sure you maintain your social distancing and lift all your belongings. Um, next week's meeting will take place at 10 a.m. and it needs to conclude at 12. Um, so it'll be next Wednesday at the 3rd of February. Oh, we're, we're in room 29. Apologies for the, the deputy chair for that meeting. And we'll, we'll be receiving a briefing um, on the draft budget and a briefing on hazardous substances in the common framework. So if members are content, we shall adjourn. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.